History of Australia, Wikipedia Audio The history of Australia refers to the history of the area and people of the Commonwealth of Australia and its preceding indigenous and colonial societies. Aboriginal Australians arrived on the Australian mainland by sea from maritime Southeast Asia between 40,000 and 70,000 years ago. The artistic, musical, and spiritual traditions they established are among the longest surviving such traditions in human history. The first known landing in Australia by Europeans was by Dutch navigator Willem Jens Zoan in 1606. 29 other Dutch navigators explored the western and southern coasts in the 17th century, and dubbed the continent New Holland. Macassan Trepangers visited Australia's northern coasts after 1720, possibly earlier. Other European explorers followed until, in 1770, Lt. James Cook charted the east coast of Australia for Great Britain and returned with accounts favouring colonisation at Botany Bay, New South Wales. A first fleet of British ships arrived at Botany Bay in January 1788 to establish a penal colony, the first colony on the Australian mainland. In the century that followed, the British established other colonies on the continent, and European explorers ventured into its interior. Indigenous Australians were greatly weakened and their numbers diminished by introduced diseases and conflict with the colonists during this period. Aboriginal Australia Gold rushes and agricultural industries brought prosperity. Autonomous parliamentary democracies began to be established throughout the six British colonies from the mid-19th century. The colonies voted by referendum to unite in a federation in 1901, and modern Australia came into being. Australia fought on the side of Britain in the two world wars and became a long-standing ally of the United States when threatened by Imperial Japan during World War II. Trade with Asia increased and a post-war immigration program received more than 6.5 million migrants from every continent. Supported by immigration of people from more than 200 countries since the end of World War II, the population increased to more than 23 million by 2014, and sustains the world's 12th largest national economy. The ancestors of indigenous Australians are believed to have arrived in Australia 40,000 to 60,000 years ago, and possibly as early as 70,000 years ago. They developed a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, established enduring spiritual and artistic traditions and used stone technologies. At the time of first European contact, it has been estimated the existing population was at least 350,000, while recent archaeological finds suggest that a population of 750,000 could have been sustained. There is considerable archaeological discussion as to the route taken by the first colonizers. People appear to have arrived by sea during a period of glaciation, when New Guinea and Tasmania were joined to the continent. The journey still required sea travel however, making them amongst the world's earlier mariners. Scott Kane wrote in 2013 that the first wave may have been prompted by the eruption of Mount Toba and if they arrived around 70,000 years ago could have crossed the water from Timor, when the sea level was low but if they came later, Around 50,000 years ago, a more likely route would be through the Moluccas to New Guinea. Given that the likely landfall regions have been under around 50 meters of water for the last 15,000 years, it is unlikely that the timing will ever be established with certainty. The earliest known human remains were found at Lake Mungo, a dry lake in the southwest of New South Wales. Remains found at Mungo suggest one of the world's oldest known cremations, 
thus indicating early evidence for religious ritual among humans. According to Australian Aboriginal mythology and the animist framework developed in Aboriginal Australia, the Dreaming is a sacred era in which ancestral totemic spirit beings formed the creation. The Dreaming established the laws and structures of society and the ceremonies performed to ensure continuity of life and land. It remains a prominent feature of Australian Aboriginal art. Aboriginal art is believed to be the oldest continuing tradition of art in the world. Evidence of Aboriginal art can be traced back at least 30,000 years and is found throughout Australia. In terms of age and abundance, cave art in Australia is comparable to that of Lascaux and Altamira in Europe. Manning Clark wrote that the ancestors of the Aborigines were slow to reach Tasmania, probably owing to an ice barrier existing across the southeast of the continent. The Aborigines, he noted, did not develop agriculture, probably owing to a lack of seed-bearing plants and animals suitable for domestication. Thus, the population remained low. Clark considered that the three potential pre-European colonizing powers and traders of East Asia the Hindu Buddhists of southern India, the Muslims of northern India and the Chinese each petered out in their southward advance and did not attempt a settlement across the straits separating Indonesia from Australia. But Trepang fishermen did reach the north coast, which they called Merg or Land of the Trepang. For centuries, Makassan trade flourished with Aborigines on Australia's north coast, particularly with the Yaengu people of northeast Arnhem Land. The greatest population density for Aborigines developed in the southern and eastern regions, the River Murray Valley in particular. Aborigines lived and used resources on the continent sustainably agreeing to cease hunting and gathering at particular times to give populations and resources the chance to replenish. The arrival of Australia's first people nevertheless affected the continent significantly, and, along with climate change, may have contributed to the extinction of Australia's megafauna. The practice of fire stick farming amongst northern Aborigines to increase the abundance of plants that attracted animals, transformed dry rainforest into savanna. The introduction of the dingo by Aboriginal people around 3,0004,000 years ago may, along with human hunting, have contributed to the extinction of the thylacine, Tasmanian devil and Tasmanian native hen from mainland Australia. One genetic study in 2012 by Irina Pugak and colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology has suggested that about 4,000 years before the first fleet landed, some Indian explorers settled in Australia and assimilated into the local population in roughly 2217 BC. Despite considerable cultural continuity, life was not without significant changes. Some 10 12, 000 years ago, Tasmania became isolated from the mainland, and some stone technologies failed to reach the Tasmanian people. The land was not always kind, Aboriginal people of southeastern Australia endured more than a dozen volcanic eruptions. Mount Gambier, a mere 1,400 years ago. In southeastern Australia, near present-day Lake Conda, semi-permanent villages of beehive-shaped shelters of stone developed, near bountiful food supplies. The early wave of European observers like William Dampier described the hunter-gatherer lifestyle of the Aborigines of the West Coast as arduous and miserable. Lieutenant James Cook on the other hand, speculated in his journal that the natives of New Holland might in fact be far happier than Europeans. Watkin Tench, of the First Fleet wrote of an admiration for the Aborigines of Botany Bay as good-natured and good-humoured people, 
though he also reported violent hostility between the Iera and Camaray Igal peoples, and noted violent domestic altercations between his friend Benny Long and his wife Berenguru. Settlers of the 19th century like Edward Kerr observed that Aborigines suffered less and enjoyed life more than the majority of civilized men. Historian Geoffrey Blaney wrote that the material standard of living for Aborigines was generally high, higher than that of many Europeans living at the time of the Dutch discovery of Australia. Early Indigenous Prehistory By 1788, the population existed as 250 individual nations, many of which were in alliance with one another, and within each nation there existed several clans, from as few as five or six to as many as thirty or forty. Each nation had its own language and a few had multiple. Thus over 250 languages existed, around 200 of which are now extinct. Intricate kinship rules ordered the social relations of the people and diplomatic messengers and meeting rituals smoothed relations between groups, keeping group fighting, sorcery and domestic disputes to a minimum. Permanent European settlers arrived at Sydney in 1788 and came to control most of the continent by end of the 19th century. Bastions of largely unaltered Aboriginal societies survived, particularly in northern and western Australia into the 20th century, until finally, a group of Pintupi people of the Gibson Desert became the last people to be contacted by outsider ways in 1984. While much knowledge was lost, Aboriginal art, music and culture, often scorned by Europeans during the initial phases of contact, survived and in time came to be celebrated by the wider Australian community. The first known landing in Australia by Europeans was by Dutch navigator Willem Jans Zoan in 1606. Twenty-nine other Dutch navigators explored the western and southern coasts in the 17th century, and dubbed the continent New Holland. Macassan Trepangers visited Australia's northern coasts after 1720, possibly earlier. Other European explorers followed until navigator Lt. James Cook claimed the east coast of Australia for Britain in 1770, without conducting negotiations with the existing inhabitants, though before his departure, the President of the Royal Society, one of the voyage's sponsors, wrote that the people of any lands he might discover were the natural and in the strictest sense of the word, the legal possessors of the several regions they inhabit. No European nation has a right to occupy any part of their country, or settle among them without their voluntary consent. Conquest over such people can give no just title, because they could never be the aggressors. Cook returned with accounts favouring colonisation at Botany Bay, New South Wales. The first governor, Arthur Philip, was instructed explicitly to establish friendship and good relations with the Aborigines and interactions between the early newcomers and the ancient landowners varied considerably throughout the colonial period from the curiosity displayed by the early interlocutors Benny Long and Bungary of Sydney, to the outright hostility of Pemulwui and Windradine of the Sydney region, and Yagan around Perth. Benny Long and a companion became the first Australians to sail to Europe, where they met King George III. Bungary accompanied the explorer Matthew Flinders on the first circumnavigation of Australia. Pemulwui was accused of the first killing of a white settler in 1790, and Windradine resisted early British expansion beyond the Blue Mountains. Conflict and Disease Impact of European Settlement Early European Exploration According to the historian Geoffrey Blaney, in Australia during the colonial period, 
in a thousand isolated places there were occasional shootings and spearings. Even worse, smallpox, measles, influenza and other new diseases swept from one aboriginal camp to another. The main conqueror of aborigines was to be disease and its ally, demoralization. Dutch Exploration and Discovery Others Colonization Plans for Colonization Establishment of British Colonies Conflict in the Hawkesbury Nepean River district near the settlement at Sydney continued from 1795-1816. Pemulwuy's War, Ted Berry's War, and the Nepean War as well as the interwar violence of the 1804-1805 conflict. It was fought using mostly guerrilla warfare tactics, however, several conventional battles also took place. The wars resulted in the defeat of the Hawkesbury and Nepean indigenous clans who were subsequently dispossessed of their lands. Even before the arrival of European settlers in local districts beyond coastal New South Wales, Eurasian disease often preceded them. A smallpox epidemic was recorded near Sydney in 1789, which wiped out about half the aborigines around Sydney. Opinion is divided as to the source of the smallpox. Some researchers argue that the smallpox was acquired through contact with Indonesian fishermen in the far north and then spread across the continent, reaching the Sydney area in 1789. Other research by Craig Meir, Michael Bennett, and Christopher Warren argues that, despite controversy, it is highly likely that the 1789 outbreak of smallpox was a deliberate act by British Marines when they ran out of ammunition and needed to expand the settlement out to Parramatta. Smallpox then spread well beyond the then limits of European settlement, including much of southeastern Australia reappearing in 1829-30, killing 40-60% of the aboriginal population. The impact of Europeans was profoundly disruptive to aboriginal life and, though the extent of violence is debated, there was considerable conflict on the frontier. At the same time, some settlers were quite aware they were usurping the aborigines' place in Australia. In 1845, settler Charles Griffith sought to justify this, writing, The question comes to this, which has the better right the savage, born in a country, which he runs over but can scarcely be said to occupy, or the civilized man, who comes to introduce into this, unproductive country, the industry which supports life. 1788, New South Wales From the 1960s, Australian writers began to reassess European assumptions about Aboriginal Australia with works including Alan Moorhead's The Fatal Impact and Geoffrey Blaney's Landmark History Triumph of the Nomads. In 1968, anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner described the lack of historical accounts of relations between Europeans and Aborigines as the Great Australian Silence. Historian Henry Reynolds argues that there was a historical neglect of the Aborigines by historians until the late 1960s. Early commentaries often tended to describe Aborigines as doomed to extinction following the arrival of Europeans. William Westgarth's 1864 book on the colony of Victoria observed, the case of the Aborigines of Victoria confirms, it would seem almost an immutable law of nature that such inferior dark races should disappear. However, by the early 1970s historians like Lyndall Ryan, Henry Reynolds and Raymond Evans were trying to document and estimate the conflict and human toll on the frontier.
Many events illustrate violence and resistance as Aborigines sought to protect their lands from invasion and as settlers and pastoralists attempted to establish their presence. In May 1804, at Riston Cove, Van Diemen's Land, perhaps 60 Aborigines were killed when they approached the town. The British established a new outpost in Van Diemen's Land in 1803. Although Tasmanian history is amongst the most contested by modern historians, conflict between colonists and Aborigines was referred to in some contemporary accounts as the Black War. The combined effects of disease, dispossession, intermarriage, and conflict saw a collapse of the Aboriginal population of Tasmania from a few thousand people when the British arrived, to a few hundred by the 1830s. Estimates of how many people were killed during the period begin at around 300, though verification of the true figure is now impossible. In 1830 Governor Sir George Arthur sent an armed party to push the Big River and Oyster Bay tribes out of the British settled districts. The effort failed and George Augustus Robinson proposed to set out unarmed to mediate with the remaining tribes people in 1833. With the assistance of Truganini as guide and translator, Robinson convinced remaining tribesmen to surrender to an isolated new settlement at Flinders Island, where most later died of disease. In 1838, at least 28 Aborigines were murdered at the Myall Creek in New South Wales, resulting in the unprecedented conviction and hanging of six white and one African convict settlers by the colonial courts. Aborigines also attacked white settlers in 1838. Fourteen Europeans were killed at Broken River in Port Phillip District, by Aborigines of the Ovens River, almost certainly in revenge for the illicit use of Aboriginal women. Captain Hutton of Port Phillip District once told Chief Protector of Aborigines George Augustus Robinson that if a member of a tribe offend, destroy the whole. Queensland's Colonial Secretary A.H. Palmer wrote in 1884 the nature of the blacks was so treacherous that they were only guided by fear in fact it was only possible to rule, the Australian Aboriginal, by brute force. The most recent massacre of Aborigines was at Coniston in the Northern Territory in 1928. There are numerous other massacre sites in Australia, although supporting documentation varies. From the 1830s, colonial governments established the now controversial offices of the Protector of Aborigines in an effort to avoid mistreatment of indigenous peoples and conduct government policy towards them. Christian churches in Australia sought to convert Aborigines, and were often used by government to carry out welfare and assimilation policies. Colonial churchmen such as Sydney's first Catholic Archbishop, John Polding strongly advocated for Aboriginal rights and dignity and prominent Aboriginal activist Noel Pearson, who was raised at a Lutheran mission in Cape York has written that Christian missions throughout Australia's colonial history provided a haven from the hell of life on the Australian frontier while at the same time facilitating colonisation. The Caledon Bay Crisis of 1932-34 saw one of the last incidents of violent interaction on the frontier of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia which began when the spearing of Japanese poachers who had been molesting Yaengu women was followed by the killing of a policeman. As the crisis unfolded, national opinion swung behind the Aboriginal people involved, and the first appeal on behalf of an Indigenous Australian to the High Court of Australia was launched. Following the crisis, the anthropologist Donald Thompson was dispatched by the government to live among the Yaengu. Elsewhere around this time, activists like Sir Douglas Nichols were commencing their campaigns for Aboriginal rights within the established Australian political system and the Age of Frontier conflict closed. <laughs>
cooperation. Frontier encounters in Australia were not universally negative. Positive accounts of Aboriginal customs and encounters are also recorded in the journals of early European explorers, who often relied on Aboriginal guides and assistants. Charles Sturt employed Aboriginal envoys to explore the Murray Darling. The lone survivor of the Burke and Wills expedition was nursed by local Aborigines, and the famous Aboriginal explorer Jackie Jackie loyally accompanied his ill-fated friend Edmund Kennedy to Cape York. Respectful studies were conducted by such as Walter Baldwin Spencer and Frank Gillen in their renowned anthropological study The Native Tribes of Central Australia, and by Donald Thompson of Arnhem Land. In inland Australia, the skills of Aboriginal stockmen became highly regarded and in the 20th century, Aboriginal stockmen like Vincent Lingery became national figures in their campaigns for better pay and improved working conditions. Establishment of Further Colonies Removal of Children The removal of indigenous children by which mixed-race children of Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent were removed from their families by Australian federal and state government agencies and church missions, was a policy actively conducted in the period between approximately 1905 and 1969. The Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission argued that these removals constituted attempted genocide and had a major impact on the indigenous population. Such interpretations of Aboriginal history are disputed by a few historians such as Keith Winescootle as being exaggerated or fabricated for political or ideological reasons. This debate is part of what is known within Australia as the History Wars. Convicts in Colonial Society Although a theory of Portuguese discovery in the 1520s exists, it lacks definitive evidence. The Vok S ship, Dufkin, led by Willem Jans Zoan, made the first documented European landing in Australia in 1606. That same year, a Spanish expedition sailing in nearby waters and led by Portuguese navigator Pedro Fernandes de Quiroz had landed in the New Hebrides and, believing them to be the fabled southern continent, named the land Australia del Espiritu Santo, in honor of his Queen Margaret of Austria, the wife of Philip III of Spain. Later that year, Quiro's deputy Luis Vaz de Torres sailed to the north of Australia through Torres Strait, along New Guinea's southern coast. The Dutch, following shipping routes to the Dutch East Indies, or in search of gold, spices, or Christian converts proceeded to contribute a great deal to Europe's knowledge of Australia's coast. In 1616, Dirk Hardig, sailing off course, en route from the Cape of Good Hope to Batavia, landed on an island off Shark Bay, West Australia. In 1622-23 the Leowin made the first recorded rounding of the southwest corner of the continent, and gave her name to Cape Leowin. Free Colony at South Australia Exploration of the Continent from autonomy to federation. In 1627 the south coast of Australia was accidentally discovered by Franz Wathigson and named T. Land van Peternutz, in honour of the highest-ranking passenger, Peternutz, extraordinary councillor of India. In 1628 a squadron of Dutch ships was sent by the Governor-General of the Dutch East Indies Peter de Carpentier to explore the northern coast. These ships made extensive examinations, particularly in the Gulf of Carpentaria, named in honour of de Carpentier. Abel Tasman S. Voyage of 1642 was the first known European expedition to reach Van Diemen's Land and New Zealand, and to sight Fiji. On his second voyage of 1644, 
he also contributed significantly to the mapping of Australia proper, making observations on the land and people of the north coast below New Guinea. A map of the world inlaid into the floor of the Burgersaal of the New Amsterdam Stadhuis in 1655 revealed the extent of Dutch charts of much of Australia's coast. Based on the 1648 map by Joan Blau, Nova et Accurata Cimeterarum Orbis Tabula, it incorporated Tasman's discoveries, subsequently reproduced in the map. Archipelagus Orientalis of Asiaticus published in the Kerferstan Atlas. In 1664 the French geographer, Melchis de Thevenot, published in Relations de Divers Voyages Curieuse a map of New Holland. Thevenot divided the continent in two, between Nova Hollandia to the west and Terre Austral to the east. Emmanuel Bowen reproduced the Venot's map in his complete system of geography, retitling it a complete map of the southern continent and adding three inscriptions promoting the benefits of exploring and colonizing the country. One inscription said, It is impossible to conceive a country that promises fairer from its situation than this of Terra Australis, no longer incognita, as this map demonstrates but the southern continent discovered. It lies precisely in the richest climates of the world, and therefore whoever perfectly discovers and settles it will become infallibly possessed of territories as rich, as fruitful, and as capable of improvement, as any that have hitherto been found out, either in the East Indies or the West. Bowen's map was republished in John Camel's editions of John Harris's Navigantium et Itinerantium Bibliotheca, or Voyages and Travels. This book recommended exploration of the east coast of New Holland, with a view to a British colonization, by way of Abel Tasman's route to Van Diemen's Land. Although various proposals for colonization were made, notably by Pierre Putty from 1717 to 1744, none was officially attempted. Indigenous Australians were less able to trade with Europeans than were the peoples of India, the East Indies, China, and Japan. The Dutch East India Company concluded that there was no good to be done there. They turned down Putty's scheme with the comment that, there is no prospect of use or benefit to the company in it, but rather very certain and heavy costs. With the exception of further Dutch visits to the West, however, Australia remained largely unvisited by Europeans until the first British explorations. John Callender put forward a proposal in 1766 for Britain to found a colony of banished convicts in the South Sea or in Terra Australis to enable the mother country to exploit the riches of those regions. He said, This world must present us with many things entirely new, as hitherto we have had little more knowledge of it, than if it had lain in another planet. In 1769, Lieutenant James Cook in command of the HMS Endeavour, travelled to Tahiti to observe and record the transit of Venus. Cook also carried secret admiralty instructions to locate the supposed southern continent, there is reason to imagine that a continent, or land of great extent, may be found to the southward of the track of former navigators. This continent was not found, a disappointment to Alexander Dalrymple and his fellow members of the Royal Society who had urged the Admiralty to undertake this mission. Cook decided to survey the east coast of New Holland, the only major part of that continent that had not been charted by Dutch navigators. On April 19, 1770, the Endeavour sighted the east coast of Australia and ten days later landed at Botany Bay. Cook charted the coast to its northern extent and, along with the ship's naturalist, Joseph Banks, 
who subsequently reported favorably on the possibilities of establishing a colony at Botany Bay. Cook formally took possession of the east coast of New Holland on 21 22 August 1770, and noted in his journal that he could land no more upon this eastern coast of New Holland, and on the western side I can make no new discovery the honour of which belongs to the Dutch navigators and as such they may lay claim to it as their property but the eastern coast from the latitude of 38 south down to this place I am confident was never seen or visited by any European before us and therefore by the same rule belongs to Great Britain. In 1772, a French expedition led by Louis Alano de saint Alwarn became the first Europeans to formally claim sovereignty over the west coast of Australia, but no attempt was made to follow this with colonisation. The ambition of Sweden's King Gustav III to establish a colony for his country at the Swan River in 1786 remained stillborn. It was not until 1788 that economic, technological and political conditions in Great Britain made it possible and worthwhile for that country to make the large effort of sending the first fleet to New South Wales. Seventeen years after Cook's landfall on the east coast of Australia, the British government decided to establish a colony at Botany Bay. The American Revolutionary War saw Britain lose most of its North American colonies and consider establishing replacement territories. In 1779 Sir Joseph Banks, the eminent scientist who had accompanied James Cook on his 1770 voyage, recommended Botany Bay as a suitable site for settlement saying that it was not to be doubted that a tract of land such as New Holland, which was larger than the whole of Europe, would furnish matter of advantageous return. Under Banks' guidance, the American loyalist James Matra, who had also travelled with Cook, produced a proposal for establishing a settlement in New South Wales, proposing the establishment of a colony composed of American loyalists, Chinese, and South Sea Icelanders. Matra reasoned that, the country was suitable for plantations of sugar, cotton, and tobacco, New Zealand timber and hemp or flax could prove valuable commodities, it could form a base for Pacific trade, and it could be a suitable compensation for displaced American loyalists. Following an interview with Secretary of State Lord Sidney in 1784, Matra amended his proposal to include convicts as settlers, considering that this would benefit both economy to the public, and humanity to the individual. Matra's plan provided the original blueprint for settlement. Records show the government was considering it in 1784. The London newspapers announced in November 1784 that, a plan has been presented to the Minister, and is now before the Cabinet, for instituting a new colony in New Holland. In this vast tract of land, every sort of produce and improvement of which the various soils of the earth are capable, may be expected. The government also incorporated the settlement of Norfolk Island into their plan, with its attractions of timber and flax, proposed by Banks Royal Society colleagues, Sir John Call and Sir George Young. At the same time, humanitarians and reformers were campaigning in Britain against the appalling conditions in British prisons and hulks. In 1777 prison reformer John Howard wrote The State of Prisons in England and Wales, exposing the harsh conditions of the prison system to genteel society. Penal transportation was already well established as a central plank of English criminal law and until the American Revolution about a thousand criminals per year were sent to Maryland and Virginia. It served as a powerful deterrent to law-breaking. According to historian David Hill, 
Europeans knew little about the geography of the globe and to convicts in England, transportation to Botany Bay was a frightening prospect. Echoing John Callender, he said Australia might as well have been another planet. In 1933, Sir Ernest Scott, stated the traditional view of the reasons for colonization, it is clear that the only consideration which weighed seriously with the Pitt government was the immediately pressing and practical one of finding a suitable place for a convict settlement. In the early 1960s, historian Geoffrey Blaney questioned the traditional view of foundation purely as a convict dumping ground. His book The Tyranny of Distance suggested ensuring supplies of flax and timber after the loss of the American colonies may have also been motivations, and Norfolk Island was the key to the British decision. A number of historians responded and debate brought to light a large amount of additional source material on the reasons for settlement. This has most recently been set out and discussed by Professor Alan Frost. The decision to settle was taken when it seemed the outbreak of civil war in the Netherlands might precipitate a war in which Britain would be again confronted with the alliance of the three naval powers, France, Holland and Spain, which had brought her to defeat in 1783. Under these circumstances, the strategic advantages of a colony in New South Wales described in James Matra's proposal were attractive. Matra wrote that such a settlement could facilitate attacks upon the Spanish in South America and the Philippines, and against the Dutch East Indies. In 1790, during the Nootka Crisis, plans were made for naval expeditions against Spain's possessions in the Americas and the Philippines, in which New South Wales was assigned the role of a base for refreshment, communication, and retreat. On subsequent occasions into the early 19th century when war threatened or broke out between Britain and Spain, these plans were revived and only the short length of the period of hostilities in each case prevented them from being put into effect. George Forster, who had sailed under Lt. James Cook in the voyage of the Resolution, wrote in 1786 on the future prospects of the British colony. New Holland, an island of enormous extent or it might be said, a third continent, is the future homeland of a new civilized society which, however mean its beginning may seem to be, nevertheless promises within a short time to become very important. And the merchant adventurer and would-be colonizer of southwestern Australia under the Swedish flag, William Boltz, said to the Swedish ambassador in Paris, Eric von Stahl in December 1789, that the British had founded at Botany Bay, a settlement which in time will become of the greatest importance to the commerce of the globe. The territory claimed by Britain included all of Australia eastward of the meridian of 135 degrees east and all the islands in the Pacific Ocean between the latitudes of Cape York and the southern tip of Van Diemen's Land. The western limit of 135 degrees east was set at the meridian dividing New Holland from Terra Australis shown on Emmanuel Bowen's complete map of the southern continent published in John Camel's editions of John Harris's Navigantium et Itinerantium Bibliotheca, or Voyages and Travels. It was a vast claim which elicited excitement at the time, the Dutch translator of First Fleet Officer and author Watkin Tench essay narrative of the expedition to Botany Bay wrote, a single province which, beyond all doubt, is the largest on the whole surface of the earth. From their definition it covers, in its greatest extent from east to west, virtually a fourth of the whole circumference of the globe. Spanish naval commander Alessandro Malaspina, who visited Sydney in March-April 1793 reported to his government that, the transportation of the convicts constituted the means and not the object of the enterprise. <laughs>
the extension of dominion, mercantile speculations and the discovery of mines were the real object. Frenchman François Perron, of the Baden expedition visited Sydney in 1802 and reported to the French government, how can it be conceived that such a monstrous invasion was accomplished, with no complaint in Europe to protest against it? How can it be conceived that Spain, who had previously raised so many objections opposing the occupation of the Maluans, meekly allowed a formidable empire to arise to facing her richest possessions, an empire which must either invade or liberate them. The colony included the current islands of New Zealand. In 1817, the British government withdrew the extensive territorial claim over the South Pacific. In practice, the governor's writ had been shown not to run in the islands of the South Pacific. The Church Missionary Society had concerns over atrocities committed against the natives of the South Sea Islands, and the ineffectiveness of the New South Wales government to deal with the lawlessness. As a result, on June 27, 1817, Parliament passed an act for the more effectual punishment of murders and manslaughters committed in places not within His Majesty's dominions, which described Tahiti, New Zealand and other islands of the South Pacific as being not within His Majesty's dominions. The British colony of New South Wales was established with the arrival of the first fleet of eleven vessels under the command of Captain Arthur Phillip in January 1788. It consisted of over a thousand settlers, including 778 convicts. A few days after arrival at Botany Bay the fleet moved to the more suitable Port Jackson where a settlement was established at Sydney Cove on January 26, 1788. This date later became Australia's National Day, Australia Day. The colony was formally proclaimed by Governor Philip on February 7, 1788 at Sydney. Sydney Cove offered a fresh water supply and a safe harbour, which Philip described as being, without exception the finest harbour in the world here a thousand sail of the line may ride in the most perfect security. Governor Philip was vested with complete authority over the inhabitants of the colony. Enlightened for his age, Philip's personal intent was to establish harmonious relations with local Aboriginal people and try to reform as well as discipline the convicts of the colony. Philip and several of his officers most notably Watkin Tench left behind journals and accounts of which tell of immense hardships during the first years of settlement. Often Philip's officers despaired for the future of New South Wales. Early efforts at agriculture were fraught and supplies from overseas were scarce. Between 1788 and 1792 about 3,546 male and 766 female convicts were landed at Sydney many professional criminals with few of the skills required for the establishment of a colony. Many new arrivals were also sick or unfit for work and the conditions of healthy convicts only deteriorated with hard labor and poor sustenance in the settlement. The food situation reached crisis point in 1790 and the second fleet which finally arrived in June 1790 had lost a quarter of its passengers through sickness, while the condition of the convicts of the third fleet appalled Philip. From 1791 however, the more regular arrival of ships and the beginnings of trade lessened the feeling of isolation and improved supplies. Philip sent exploratory missions in search of better soils, fixed on the Parramatta region as a promising area for expansion, and moved many of the convicts from late 1788 to establish a small township which became the main centre of the colony's economic life. This left Sydney Cove only as an important port and focus of social life. <laughs>
poor equipment and unfamiliar soils and climate continued to hamper the expansion of farming from Farm Cove to Parramatta and Tungabi, but a building program, assisted by convict labour, advanced steadily. Between 1788 and 1792, convicts and their jailers made up the majority of the population but after this, a population of emancipated convicts began to grow who could be granted land and these people pioneered a non-government private sector economy and were later joined by soldiers whose military service had expired and finally, free settlers who began arriving from Britain. Governor Philip departed the colony for England on December 11, 1792, with the new settlement having survived near starvation and immense isolation for four years. On February 16, 1793 the first free settlers arrived. The settlers, Thomas Rose, with his wife and four children, Edward Powell, Thomas Webb, Joseph Webb, and Frederick Meredith. After the founding of the colony of New South Wales in 1788, Australia was divided into an eastern half, named New South Wales, under the administration of the colonial government in Sydney, and a western half named New Holland. The western boundary of 135 degrees east of Greenwich was based on the complete map of the southern continent published in Emmanuel Bowen's Complete System of Geography, and reproduced in John Camel's editions of John Harris's Navigantium et Itinerantium Bibliotheca, or Voyages and Travels. Bowen's map was based on one by Melchizedek the Venot and published in Relations des Divers Voyages, which apparently divided New Holland in the west from Terra Australis in the east by a latitude staff situated at 135 degrees east. This division, reproduced in Bowen's map, provided a convenient western boundary for the British claim because, as Watkin Tench subsequently commented in a narrative of the expedition to Botany Bay, by this partition, it may be fairly presumed, that every source of future litigation between the Dutch and us, will be forever cut off, as the discoveries of English navigators only are comparised in this territory. Thevenot said he copied his map from the one engraved in the floor of the Amsterdam Town Hall, but in that map there was no dividing line between New Holland and Terra Australis. Thevenot's map was actually copied from Joan Blau's map. Archipelagus Orientalis of Asiaticus, published in 1659 in the Kerferstan Atlas, this map was a part of Blau's world map of 1648, Nova et Accuratus Immaturarum Orbis Tabula, which first showed the land revealed by Abel Tasman's 1642 voyage as Hollandia Nova and which served as the basis for the Amsterdam Town Hall pavement map. Longitude 135 degrees east reflected the line of division between the claims of Spain and Portugal established in the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 which had formed the basis of many subsequent claims to colonial territory. An historical narrative of the discovery of New Holland and New South Wales, published in November 1786, contained a general chart of New Holland, including New South Wales and Botany Bay, with the adjacent countries, and new discovered islands which showed all the territory claimed under the jurisdiction of the Governor of New South Wales. Romantic descriptions of the beauty, mild climate, and fertile soil of Norfolk Island in the South Pacific led the British government to establish a subsidiary settlement of the New South Wales colony there in 1788. It was hoped that the giant Norfolk Island pine trees and flax plants growing wild on the island might provide the basis for a local industry which, particularly in the case of flax, 
would provide an alternative source of supply to Russia for an article which was essential for making cordage and sails for the ships of the British Navy. However, the island had no safe harbour, which led the colony to be abandoned and the settlers evacuated to Tasmania in 1807. The island was subsequently resettled as a penal settlement in 1824. In 1798, George Bass and Matthew Flinders circumnavigated Van Diemen's Land, proving that it was an island. In 1802, Flinders successfully circumnavigated Australia for the first time. Van Diemen's Land, now known as Tasmania, was settled in 1803 following a failed attempt to settle at Sullivan Bay in what is now Victoria. Other British settlements followed, at various points around the continent, many of them unsuccessful. The East India Trade Committee recommended in 1823 that a settlement be established on the coast of Northern Australia to forestall the Dutch, and Captain J.J.G. Bremer, R.N was commissioned to form a settlement between Bathurst Island and the Coburg Peninsula. Bremer fixed the site of his settlement at Fort Dundas on Melville Island in 1824 and, because this was well to the west of the boundary proclaimed in 1788, proclaimed British sovereignty over all the territory as far west as longitude 129 degrees east. The new boundary included Melville and Bathurst Islands, and the adjacent mainland. In 1826, the British claim was extended to the whole Australian continent when Major Edmund Lockyer established a settlement on King George Sound, but the eastern border of Western Australia remained unchanged at longitude 129 degrees east. In 1824, a penal colony was established near the mouth of the Brisbane River. In 1829, the Swan River Colony and its capital of Perth were founded on the west coast proper and also assumed control of King George Sound. Initially a free colony, Western Australia later accepted British convicts, because of an acute labour shortage. The colony of South Australia was settled in 1836, with its western and eastern boundaries set at 132 degrees and 141 degrees east of Greenwich, and to the north at latitude 26 degrees south. The western and eastern boundary points were chosen as they marked the extent of coastline first surveyed by Matthew Flinders in 1802. The northern boundary was set at the parallel of latitude 26 degrees south by the British Parliament because that was considered to be the limit of effective control of territory that could be exercised by a settlement founded on the shores of Gulf St. Vincent. The South Australian Company had proposed the parallel of 20 degrees south, later reduced to the Tropic of Capricorn. Between 1788 and 1868, approximately 161,700 convicts were transported to the Australian colonies of New South Wales, Van Diemen's Land and Western Australia. Historian Lloyd Robson has estimated that perhaps two-thirds were thieves from working-class towns, particularly from the Midlands and north of England. The majority were repeat offenders. Whether transportation managed to achieve its goal of reforming or not, some convicts were able to leave the prison system in Australia, after 1801 they could gain tickets of leave for good behaviour and be assigned to work for free men for wages. A few went on to have successful lives as emancipists, having been pardoned at the end of their sentence. Female convicts had fewer opportunities. Some convicts, particularly Irish convicts, 
had been transported to Australia for political crimes or social rebellion, so authorities were consequently suspicious of the Irish and restricted the practice of Catholicism in Australia. The Irish-led Castle Hill Rebellion of 1804 served to increase suspicions and repression. Church of England clergy meanwhile worked closely with the governors and Richard Johnson, chaplain to the First Fleet was charged by Governor Arthur Phillip, with improving public morality in the colony and was also heavily involved in health and education. The Reverend Samuel Marsden had magisterial duties, and so was equated with the authorities by the convicts becoming known as the flogging parson for the severity of his punishments. The New South Wales Corps was formed in England in 1789 as a permanent regiment to relieve the Marines who had accompanied the First Fleet. Officers of the Corps soon became involved in the corrupt and lucrative rum trade in the colony. In the Rum Rebellion of 1808, the Corps, working closely with the newly established wool trader John MacArthur, staged the only successful armed takeover of government in Australian history, deposing Governor William Bly and instigating a brief period of military rule in the colony prior to the arrival from Britain of Governor Lachlan Macquarie in 1810. Macquarie served as the last autocratic governor of New South Wales, from 1810 to 1821 and had a leading role in the social and economic development of New South Wales which saw it transition from a penal colony to a budding free society. He established public works, a bank, churches and charitable institutions and sought good relations with the Aborigines. In 1813 he sent Blacksland, Wentworth, and Lawson across the Blue Mountains, where they found the Great Plains of the Interior. Central, however to Macquarie's policy was his treatment of the Emancipists, whom he decreed should be treated as social equals to free settlers in the colony. Against opposition, he appointed emancipists to key government positions including Francis Greenway as colonial architect and William Redfern as a magistrate. London judged his public works to be too expensive and society was scandalised by his treatment of emancipists. Egalitarianism would come to be considered a central virtue among Australians. The first five governors of New South Wales realised the urgent need to encourage free settlers, but the British government remained largely indifferent. As early as 1790, Governor Arthur Phillip wrote, Your Lordship will see by my letters the little progress we have been able to make in cultivating the lands. At present this settlement only affords one person that I can employ in cultivating the lands. It was not until the 1820s that numbers of free settlers began to arrive and government schemes began to be introduced to encourage free settlers. Philanthropists Caroline Chisholm and John Dunmore Lang developed their own migration schemes. Land grants of Crown land were made by governors and settlement schemes such as those of Edward Gibbon Wakefield carried some weight in encouraging migrants to make the long voyage to Australia, as opposed to the United States or Canada. Early colonial administrations were anxious to address the gender imbalance in the population brought about by the importation of large numbers of convict men. Between 1788 and 1792, around 3,546 male to 766 female convicts were landed at Sydney. Women came to play an important role in education and welfare during colonial times. Governor Macquarie's wife, Elizabeth Macquarie took an interest in convict women's welfare.
Her contemporary Elizabeth MacArthur was noted for her feminine strength in assisting the establishment of the Australian merino wool industry during her husband John MacArthur's enforced absence from the colony following the Rum Rebellion. The Catholic Sisters of Charity arrived in 1838 and set about pastoral care in a women's prison, visiting hospitals and schools and establishing employment for convict women. The sisters went on to establish hospitals in four of the eastern states, beginning with St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney in 1857 as a free hospital for all people, but especially for the poor. Caroline Chisholm established a migrant women's shelter and worked for women's welfare in the colonies in the 1840s. Her humanitarian efforts later won her fame in England and great influence in achieving support for families in the colony. Sydney's first Catholic bishop, John Bede Polding founded an Australian order of nuns the Sisters of the Good Samaritan in 1857 to work in education and social work. The Sisters of St. Joseph were founded in South Australia by St. Mary MacKillop and Fr. Julian Tennyson Woods in 1867. MacKillop travelled throughout Australasia and established schools, convents, and charitable institutions. She was canonized by Benedict XVI in 2010, becoming the first Australian to be so honoured by the Catholic Church. From the 1820s, increasing numbers of squatters occupied land beyond the fringes of European settlement. Often running sheep on large stations with relatively few overheads, squatters could make considerable profits. By 1834, nearly 2 million kilograms of wool were being exported to Britain from Australia. By 1850, Barely 2,000 squatters had gained 30 million hectares of land and they formed a powerful and respectable interest group in several colonies. In 1835, the British Colonial Office issued the proclamation of Governor Bork reinforcing the notion that the land belonged to no one prior to the British Crown taking possession of it and quashing any likelihood of treaties with Aboriginal peoples including that signed by John Batman. Its publication meant that from then, all people found occupying land without the authority of the government would be considered illegal trespassers. Separate settlements and later, colonies, were created from parts of New South Wales, South Australia in 1836, New Zealand in 1840, Port Phillip District in 1834, later becoming the colony of Victoria in 1851, and Queensland in 1859. The Northern Territory was founded in 1863 as part of South Australia. The transportation of convicts to Australia was phased out between 1840 and 1868. Colonial Self-Government and the Gold Rushes Massive areas of land were cleared for agriculture and various other purposes in the first 100 years of European settlement. In addition to the obvious impacts this early clearing of land and importation of hard-hoofed animals had on the ecology of particular regions, it severely affected indigenous Australians, by reducing the resources they relied on for food, shelter, and other essentials. This progressively forced them into smaller areas and reduced their numbers as the majority died of newly introduced diseases and lack of resources. Indigenous resistance against the settlers was widespread, and prolonged fighting between 1788 and the 1920s led to the deaths of at least 20,000 indigenous people and between 2,000 and 2,500 Europeans. During the mid-late 19th century, 
many indigenous Australians in southeastern Australia were relocated, often forcibly, to reserves and missions. The nature of many of these institutions enabled disease to spread quickly and many were closed as their populations fell. A group in Britain led by Edward Gibbon Wakefield sought to start a colony based on free settlement rather than convict labour. In 1831, the South Australian Land Company was formed amid a campaign for a royal charter which would provide for the establishment of a privately financed free colony in Australia. While New South Wales, Tasmania, and Western Australia were established as convict settlements, the founders of South Australia had a vision of a colony with political and religious freedoms, together with opportunities for wealth through business and pastoral investments. The South Australia Act 1834, passed by the British government which established the colony reflected these desires and included a promise of representative government when the population reached 50,000 people. South Australia thus became the only colony authorised by an Act of Parliament, and which was intended to be developed at no cost to the British government. Transportation of convicts was forbidden, and poor emigrants, assisted by an emigration fund, were required to bring their families with them. Significantly, the letters patent enabling the South Australia Act 1834 included a guarantee of the rights of any Aboriginal natives and their descendants to lands they now actually occupied or enjoyed. In 1836, two ships of the South Australia Land Company left to establish the first settlement on Kangaroo Island. The foundation of South Australia is now generally commemorated as Governor John Hindmarsh's proclamation of the new province at Glenelg, on the mainland, on December 28, 1836. From 1843 to 1851, the Governor ruled with the assistance of an appointed Executive Council of paid officials. Land development and settlement was the basis of the Wakefield vision, so land law and regulations governing it were fundamental to the foundation of the province and allowed for land to be bought at a uniform price per acre, with auctions for land desired by more than one buyer, and leases made available on unused land. Proceeds from land were to fund the emigration fund to assist poor settlers to come as tradesmen and labourers. Agitation for representative government quickly emerged. Most other colonies had been founded by governors with near total authority, but in South Australia, power was initially divided between the governor and the resident commissioner, so that government could not interfere with the business affairs or freedom of religion of the settlers. By 1851 the colony was experimenting with a partially elected council. In 1798-99 George Bass and Matthew Flinders set out from Sydney in a sloop and circumnavigated Tasmania, thus proving it to be an island. In 180102 Matthew Flinders an HMS investigator led the first circumnavigation of Australia. A board ship was the Aboriginal explorer Bung Airy, of the Sydney district, who became the first person born on the Australian continent to circumnavigate the Australian continent. Previously, the famous Benny Long and a companion had become the first people born in the area of New South Wales to sail for Europe, when, in 1792 they accompanied Governor Philip to England and were presented to King George III. Bush Rangers In 1813, Gregory Blacksland, William Lawson and William Wentworth succeeded in crossing the formidable barrier of forested gullies and sheer cliffs presented by the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. At Mount Blacksland they looked out over enough grass to support the stock of the colony for 30 years, and expansion of the British settlement into the interior could begin.
In 1824 the Governor Sir Thomas Brisbane, commissioned Hamilton Hume and former Royal Navy Captain William Havel to lead an expedition to find new grazing land in the south of the colony, and also to find an answer to the mystery of where New South Wales' western rivers flowed. Over 16 weeks in 1824-25, Hume and Havel journeyed to Port Phillip and back. They made many important discoveries including the Murray River, many of its tributaries, and good agricultural and grazing lands between Gunning, New South Wales and Corio Bay, Port Phillip. Development of Australian Democracy Charles Sturt led an expedition along the Macquarie River in 1828 and discovered the Darling River. A theory had developed that the inland rivers of New South Wales were draining into an inland sea. Leading a second expedition in 1829, Sturt followed the Murrumbidgee River into a broad and noble river, the Murray River, which he named after Sir George Murray, Secretary of State for the Colonies. His party then followed this river to its junction with the Darling River, facing two threatening encounters with local Aboriginal people along the way. Sturt continued downriver onto Lake Alexandrina, where the Murray meets the sea in South Australia. Suffering greatly, the party had to row hundreds of kilometres back upstream for the return journey. Surveyor General Sir Thomas Mitchell conducted a series of expeditions from the 1830s to fill in the gaps left by these previous expeditions. He was meticulous in seeking to record the original Aboriginal place names around the colony, for which reason the majority of place names to this day retain their Aboriginal titles. Growth of Nationalism Federation Movement the Polish scientist-slash-explorer Count Paul Edmund Sturzelecki conducted surveying work in the Australian Alps in 1839 and became the first European to ascend Australia's highest peak, which he named Mount Kosciuszko in honour of the Polish patriot Tadeusz Kosciuszko. European explorers made their last great often arduous and sometimes tragic expeditions into the interior of Australia during the second half of the 19th century some with the official sponsorship of the colonial authorities and others commissioned by private investors. By 1850, large areas of the inland were still unknown to Europeans. Trailblazers like Edmund Kennedy and the Prussian naturalist Ludwig Leitch Hart, had met tragic ends attempting to fill in the gaps during the 1840s, but explorers remained ambitious to discover new lands for agriculture or answer scientific inquiries. Surveyors also acted as explorers and the colonies sent out expeditions to discover the best routes for lines of communication. The size of expeditions varied considerably from small parties of just two or three to large, well-equipped teams led by gentlemen explorers assisted by smiths, carpenters, laborers, and aboriginal guides accompanied by horses, camels or bullocks. In 1860, the ill-fated Burke and Wills led the first north-south crossing of the continent from Melbourne to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Lacking bushcraft and unwilling to learn from the local aboriginal people, Burke and Wills died in 1861, having returned from the Gulf to their rendezvous point at Cooper's Creek only to discover the rest of their party had departed the location only a matter of hours previously. Though an impressive feat of navigation, the expedition was an organisational disaster which continues to fascinate the Australian public. Federation First World War Interwar years 1920s, men, money and markets Dominion status Great Depression Second World War
Defense Policy in the 1930s War Australian Home Front Post-war boom Menzies and Liberal Dominance, 1949-72 Post-war Immigration Economic Growth and Suburban Living Alliances 1950-1972 Vietnam War In 1862, John McDowell Stewart succeeded in traversing Central Australia from south to north. His expedition mapped out the route which was later followed by the Australian Overland Telegraph Line. Uluru and Katati Juta were first mapped by Europeans in 1872 during the expeditionary period made possible by the construction of the Australian Overland Telegraph Line. In separate expeditions, Ernest Giles and William Goss were the first European explorers to this area. While exploring the area in 1872, Giles sighted Katati Judah from a location near Kings Canyon and called it Mount Olga, while the following year Goss observed Uluru and named it Ayres Rock, in honour of the Chief Secretary of South Australia, Sir Henry Ayres. These barren desert lands of Central Australia disappointed the Europeans as unpromising for pastoral expansion, but would later come to be appreciated as emblematic of Australia. The discovery of gold in Australia is traditionally attributed to Edward Hammond Hargraves, near Bathurst, New South Wales, in February 1851. Traces of gold had nevertheless been found in Australia as early as 1823 by surveyor James McBrien. As by English law all minerals belonged to the Crown, there was at first little to stimulate a search for really rich gold fields in a colony prospering under a pastoral economy. Richard Broom also argues that the California gold rush at first overawed the Australian finds, until the news of Mount Alexander reached England in May 1852, followed shortly by six ships carrying eight tons of gold. The gold rushes brought many immigrants to Australia from the British Isles, continental Europe, North America, and China. The colony of Victoria's population grew rapidly, from 76,000 in 1850 to 530,000 by 1859. Discontent arose amongst diggers almost immediately particularly on the crowded Victorian fields. The causes of this were the colonial government's administration of the diggings and the gold license system. Following a number of protests and petitions for reform, violence erupted at Ballarat in late 1854. Early on the morning of Sunday December 3, 1854, British soldiers and police attacked a stockade built on the Eureka lead holding some of the aggrieved diggers. In a short fight, at least 30 miners were killed and an unknown number wounded. O'Brien lists five soldiers of the 12th and 40th regiments killed and 12 wounded. Blinded by his fear of agitation with democratic overtones, Local Commissioner Robert Reed had felt it was absolutely necessary that a blow should be struck against the miners. But a few months later, a Royal Commission made sweeping changes to the administration of Victoria's goldfields. Its recommendations included the abolition of the license, reforms to the police force and voting rights for miners holding a miner's right. The Eureka flag that was used to represent the Ballarat miners has been seriously considered by some as an alternative to the Australian flag, because of its controversial association with democratic developments. In the 1890s, visiting author Mark Twain characterised the battle at Eureka as the finest thing in Australasian history. It was a revolution small in size, but great politically, 
it was a strike for liberty, a struggle for principle, a stand against injustice and oppression, it is another instance of a victory won by a lost battle. Alternatively, in 1999, the Premier of New South Wales, Bob Carr, dismissed the Eureka Stockade as a protest without consequence. During the 2004 Australian federal election, Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson stated his view that I think people have tried to make too much of the Eureka Stockade, trying to give it a credibility and standing that it probably doesn't enjoy. Modern Australia Emerging 1960s Melbourne Trades Hall was opened in 1859 with Trades and Labour Councils and Trades Halls opening in all cities and most regional towns in the following 40 years. During the 1880s trade unions developed among shearers, miners and stevedores, but soon spread to cover almost all blue-collar jobs. Shortages of labour led to high wages for a prosperous skilled working class whose unions demanded and got an eight-hour day and other benefits unheard of in Europe. Australia gained a reputation as the working man's paradise. Some employers tried to undercut the unions by importing Chinese labour. This produced a reaction which led to all the colonies restricting Chinese and other Asian immigration. This led to the enactment of the White Australia policy. The Australian Compact, based around centralised industrial arbitration, a degree of government assistance particularly for primary industries, and White Australia, was to continue for many years before gradually dissolving in the second half of the 20th century. New South Wales in 1855 was the first colony to gain responsible government managing most of its own affairs while remaining part of the British Empire. Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia followed in 1856, Queensland, from its foundation in 1859, and Western Australia, in 1890. The Colonial Office in London retained control of some matters, notably foreign affairs, defence and international shipping. Arts and the New Nationalism The Gold Era led to a long period of prosperity, sometimes called the Long Boom. This was fed by British investment and the continued growth of the pastoral and mining industries, in addition to the growth of efficient transport by rail, river and sea. By 1891, the sheep population of Australia was estimated at 100 million. Gold production had declined since the 1850s, but in the same year was still worth 5.2 million pounds. Eventually the economic expansion ended, the 1890s were a period of economic depression, felt most strongly in Victoria and its capital Melbourne. During the boom, Melbourne had reputedly become the richest city in the world. Civil Rights Developments The late 19th century had however, seen a great growth in the cities of southeastern Australia. Australia's population in 1900 was 3.7 million, almost 1 million of whom lived in Melbourne and Sydney. More than two-thirds of the population overall lived in cities and towns by the close of the century, making Australia one of the most urbanist societies in the Western world. Bush Rangers, originally referred to runaway convicts in the early years of the British settlement of Australia who had the survival skills necessary to use the Australian bush as a refuge to hide from the authorities. The term Bush Ranger then evolved to refer to those who abandoned social rights and privileges to take up robbery under arms as a way of life, using the bush as their base. These Bush Rangers were roughly analogous to British highwaymen and American Old West outlaws, and their crimes often included robbing small town banks or coach services.
indigenous people. More than 2,000 bushrangers are believed to have roamed the Australian countryside, beginning with the convict bolters and ending after Ned Kelly's last stand at Glen Rowan. Bold Jack Donahue is recorded as the last convict bushranger. He was reported in newspapers around 1827 as being responsible for an outbreak of bushranging on the road between Sydney and Windsor. Throughout the 1820s he was regarded as the most notorious bushranger in the colony. Leading a band of escaped convicts, Donahue became central to Australian folklore as the wild colonial boy. Bushranging was common on the mainland, but Van Diemen's land produced the most violent and serious outbreaks of convict bushrangers. Hundreds of convicts were at large in the bush farms were abandoned and martial law was proclaimed. Indigenous outlaw Mosquito defied colonial law and led attacks on settlers. The Bush Rangers' heyday was the gold rush years of the 1850s and 1860s. Women There was much bush ranging activity in the Lachlan Valley, around Forbes, Yass, and Cara in New South Wales. Frank Gardner, John Gilbert, and Ben Hall led the most notorious gangs of the period. Other active bush rangers included Dan Morgan, based in the Murray River, and Captain Thunderbolt, killed outside Urala. The increasing push of settlement, increased police efficiency, improvements in rail transport and communications technology, such as telegraphy, made it increasingly difficult for bush rangers to evade capture. Whitlam and Fraser Among the last bush rangers were the Kelly Gang, led by Ned Kelly, who were captured at Glen Rowan in 1880, two years after they were outlawed. Kelly was born in Victoria to an Irish convict father, and as a young man he clashed with the Victoria police. Following an incident at his home in 1878, police parties searched for him in the bush. After he killed three policemen, the colony proclaimed Kelly and his gang wanted outlaws. Hawk and Keating, 1983-1996 A final violent confrontation with police took place at Glen Rowan on June 28, 1880. Kelly, dressed in homemade plate metal armor and helmet, was captured and sent to jail. He was hanged for murder at Old Melbourne Jail in November 1880. His daring and notoriety made him an iconic figure in Australian history, folklore, literature, art, and film. Howard Government, 1996-2007 most notably Ned Kelly in his Geraldery letter, and in his final raid on Glen Rowan, explicitly represented themselves as political rebels. Attitudes to Kelly, by far the most well-known bush ranger, exemplify the ambivalent views of Australians regarding bush ranging. 21st Century Labour Government, 2007-2013 Liberal National Coalition Government, 2013-present Historiography Traditional Aboriginal society had been governed by councils of elders and a corporate decision-making process, but the first European-style governments established after 1788 were autocratic and run by appointed governors although English law was transplanted into the Australian colonies by virtue of the doctrine of reception, thus notions of the rights and processes established by the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights 1689 were brought from Britain by the colonists. Agitation for representative government began soon after the settlement of the colonies. The oldest legislative body in Australia, the New South Wales Legislative Council, 
was created in 1825 as an appointed body to advise the Governor of New South Wales. William Wentworth established the Australian Patriotic Association in 1835 to demand democratic government for New South Wales. The reformist Attorney General, John Plunkett, sought to apply Enlightenment principles to governance in the colony, pursuing the establishment of equality before the law, first by extending jury rights to emancipists, then by extending legal protections to convicts, assigned servants and aborigines. Plunkett twice charged the colonist perpetrators of the Myall Creek massacre of aborigines with murder resulting in a conviction and his landmark Church Act of 1836 disestablished the Church of England and established legal equality between Anglicans, Catholics, Presbyterians, and later Methodists. Reference Books Historical Surveys Early Maritime History Primary Sources in 1840, the Adelaide City Council and the Sydney City Council were established. Men who possessed £1,000 worth of property were able to stand for election and wealthy landowners were permitted up to four votes each in elections. Australia's first parliamentary elections were conducted for the New South Wales Legislative Council in 1843 again with voting rights tied to property ownership or financial capacity. Voter rights were extended further in New South Wales in 1850 and elections for legislative councils were held in the colonies of Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. By the mid-19th century, there was a strong desire for representative and responsible government in the colonies of Australia fed by the democratic spirit of the gold fields evident at the Eureka Stockade and the ideas of the great reform movements sweeping Europe, the United States and the British Empire. The end of convict transportation accelerated reform in the 1840s and 1850s. The Australian Colonies Government Act was a landmark development which granted representative constitutions to New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania and the colonies enthusiastically set about writing constitutions which produced democratically progressive parliaments though the constitutions generally maintained the role of the colonial upper houses as representative of social and economic interests and all established constitutional monarchies monarchies with the British monarch as the symbolic head of state. In 1855, limited self-government was granted by London to New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. An innovative secret ballot was introduced in Victoria, Tasmania, and South Australia in 1856 in which the government supplied voting paper containing the names of candidates and voters could select in private. This system was adopted around the world, becoming known as the Australian Ballot. 1855 also saw the granting of the right to vote to all male British subjects 21 years or over in South Australia. This right was extended to Victoria in 1857 and New South Wales the following year. The other colonies followed until, in 1896, Tasmania became the last colony to grant universal male suffrage. Propertied women in the colony of South Australia were granted the vote in local elections in 1861. Henrietta Dugdale formed the first Australian Women's Suffrage Society in Melbourne in 1884. Women became eligible to vote for the Parliament of South Australia in 1895. This was the first legislation in the world permitting women also to stand for election to political office and, in 1897, 
Catherine Helen Spence became the first female political candidate for political office, unsuccessfully standing for election as a delegate to the Federal Convention on Australian Federation. Western Australia granted voting rights to women in 1899. Legally, Indigenous Australian males generally gained the right to vote during this period when Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania and South Australia gave voting rights to all male British subjects over 21. Only Queensland and Western Australia barred Aboriginal people from voting. Thus, Aboriginal men and women voted in some jurisdictions for the first Commonwealth Parliament in 1901. Early federal parliamentary reform and judicial interpretation however sought to limit Aboriginal voting in practice a situation which endured until rights activists began campaigning in the 1940s. Though the various parliaments of Australia have been constantly evolving, the key foundations for elected parliamentary government have maintained an historical continuity in Australia from the 1850s into the 21st century. By the late 1880s, a majority of people living in the Australian colonies were native-born, although over 90 per centre were of British and Irish heritage. Historian Don Gibb suggests that bushranger Ned Kelly represented one dimension of the emerging attitudes of the native-born population. Identifying strongly with family and mates, Kelly was opposed to what he regarded as oppression by police and powerful squatters. Almost mirroring the Australian stereotype later defined by historian Russell Ward, Kelly became a skilled bushman adept with guns, horses and fists and winning admiration from his peers in the district. Journalist Vance Palmer suggested although Kelly came to typify the rebellious persona of the country for later generations, belonged to another period. The origins of distinctly Australian painting is often associated with this period and the Heidelberg School of the 1880s 1890s. Artists such as Arthur Streeton, Frederick McCubbin, and Tom Roberts applied themselves to recreating in their art a truer sense of light and colour as seen in Australian landscape. Like the European Impressionists, they painted in the open air. These artists found inspiration in the unique light and colour which characterises the Australian bush. Their most recognised work involves scenes of pastoral and wild Australia, featuring the vibrant, even harsh colours of Australian summers. Australian literature was equally developing a distinct voice. The classic Australian writers Henry Lawson, Banjo Patterson, Miles Franklin, Norman Lindsay, Steele Rudd, Mary Gilmore, C.J. Dennis and Dorothea McKellar were all forged by and indeed helped to forge this period of growing national identity. Views of Australia at times conflicted Lawson and Patterson contributed a series of verses to the Bulletin magazine in which they engaged in a literary debate about the nature of life in Australia, Lawson derided Patterson as a romantic, while Patterson thought Lawson full of doom and gloom. Patterson wrote the lyrics of the much-loved folk song Waltzing Matilda in 1895. The song has often been suggested as Australia's national anthem and advance Australia Fair, the Australian national anthem since the late 1970s, itself was written in 1887. Dennis wrote of laconic heroes in the Australian vernacular while McKellar rejected a love of England's pleasant pastures in favour of what she termed a sunburnt country in her iconic poem, My Country. A common theme throughout the nationalist art, music and writing of the late 19th century was the romantic rural or bush myth, ironically produced by one of the most urbanist societies in the world. Patterson's well-known poem Clancy of the Overflow, written in 1889, 
evokes the romantic myth. While bush ballads evidenced distinctively Australian popular medium of music and of literature, Australian artists of a more classical mould such as the opera singer Dame Nellie Melba, and painters John Peter Russell and Rupert Bunny prefigured the 20th century expatriate Australians who knew little of stockyard and rails but would travel abroad to influence Western art and culture. Despite suspicion from some sections of the colonial community about the value of nationhood, improvements in intercolonial transport and communication, including the linking of Perth to the southeastern cities by telegraph in 1877, helped break down intercolonial rivalries. Amid calls from London for the establishment of an intercolonial Australian army, and with the various colonies independently constructing railway lines, New South Wales Premier Henry Parks addressed a rural audience in his 1889 Tenterfield Oration, stating that the time had come to form a national executive government, Australia a population of three and a half millions, and the American people numbered only between three and four millions when they formed the Great Commonwealth of the United States. The numbers were about the same and surely what the Americans had done by war, the Australians could bring about in peace, without breaking the ties that held them to the mother country. Though Parks would not live to see it, his vision would be achieved within a little over a decade, and he is remembered as the father of federation. Increasing nationalism, a growing sense of national identity, improvements in transport and communications, as well as fears about immigration and defence all combined to encourage the movement, spurred on by organisations like the Australian Natives Association. Despite the growing calls for unification, loyalties to the British Empire remained strong. At a Federation Conference banquet in 1890, Henry Parks spoke of blood kinship linking the colonies to Britain and a race for whom the purpose of settling new countries has never had its equal on the face of the earth. In 1890, representatives of the six colonies and New Zealand had met in Melbourne and called for the union of the colonies and for the colonial legislatures to nominate representatives to attend a constitutional convention. The following year, the 1891 National Australasian Convention was held in Sydney, with all the future states and New Zealand represented. A draft constitutional bill was produced by the Constitution Committee, chiefly drafted by Samuel Griffith, with Inglis Clark and Charles Kingston, as well as the assistance of Edmund Barton. The delegates returned to their parliaments with the bill, but progress was slow, as Australia faced its 1890s economic depression. Nevertheless, by 1895 five of the colonies elected representatives for a second convention, which was conducted in Adelaide, Sydney and Melbourne over the space of a year, allowing time for consultation. The Constitution Committee this time appointed Barton, Richard O'Connor and John Downer to draft a bill and after much debate, New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania adopted the bill to be put to their voters. Queensland and Western Australia later moved to do the same, though New Zealand did not participate in the convention. July 1898 saw the bill put to a series of referenda in four colonies, but New South Wales rejected the proposal. In 1899, a second referendum put an amended bill to the voters of the four colonies and Queensland and the bill was endorsed. In March 1900, delegates were dispatched to London, where approval for the bill was sought from the Imperial Parliament. The bill was put to the House of Commons and passed on July 5, 1900 and, soon after, was signed into law by Queen Victoria.
Lord Hope Toon was dispatched from London, tasked with appointing an interim cabinet to oversee the foundation of the Commonwealth and conduct of the first elections. There was a more radical vision for a separate Australia by some colonists, including writer Henry Lawson, trade unionist William Lane and as found in the pages of the Sydney Bulletin. But by the end of 1899, and after much colonial debate, the citizens of five of the six Australian colonies had voted in referendums in favour of a constitution to form a federation. Western Australia voted to join in July 1900. The Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act was passed by the British Parliament on July 5, 1900 and given royal assent by Queen Victoria on July 9, 1900. The Commonwealth of Australia came into being when the Federal Constitution was proclaimed by the Governor-General, Lord Hope Toon, on January 1, 1901. From that point a system of federalism in Australia came into operation, entailing the establishment of an entirely new national government and an ongoing division of powers between that government and the states. The first federal elections were held in March 1901 and resulted in a narrow plurality for the Protectionist Party over the Free Trade Party with the Australian Labour Party polling third. Labour declared it would offer support to the party which offered concessions and Edmund Barton's protectionists formed a government, with Alfred Deakin as Attorney General. Barton promised to create a high court, and an efficient federal public service. He proposed to extend conciliation and arbitration, create a uniform railway gauge between the eastern capitals, to introduce female federal franchise to establish a system of old age pensions. He also promised to introduce legislation to safeguard white Australia from any influx of Asian or Pacific Island labour. The Labour Party had been established in the 1890s, after the failure of the Maritime and Ceres strikes. Its strength was in the Australian trade union movement which grew from a membership of just under 100,000 in 1901 to more than half a million in 1914. The platform of the ALP was democratic socialist. As noted by the historian Ross McMullen, in the national sphere Labour had taken the protectionists as far in the direction of progressive legislation as possible. In New South Wales, Frank MacDonald dominated the agitation for the early closing of shops, which was achieved with the passage of the Factories and Shops Act of 1900, while also securing the extension of the grammar school scholarship system. In Western Australia, Forrest introduced a conciliation and arbitration bill in 1900 which brought trade unions into the state's social fabric for the first time. In addition, WA Labor scored another victory with the passage of legislation which extended workers' compensation. Under the premierships of Storey and Dooley in New South Wales, Various reforms were carried out such as the establishment of the Rural Bank and the elimination of high school fees. The Labour Party's rising support at elections, together with its formation of federal government in 1904 under Chris Watson, and again in 1908, helped to unify competing conservative, free market and liberal anti-socialists into the Commonwealth Liberal Party in 1909. Although this party dissolved in 1916, a successor to its version of liberalism in Australia which in some respects comprises an alliance of Milchian liberals and Burkean conservatives united in support for individualism and opposition to socialism can be found in the modern Liberal Party. To represent rural interests, the country party was founded in 1913 in Western Australia and nationally in 1920, from a number of state-based farmers' parties.
The Immigration Restriction Act 1901 was one of the first laws passed by the new Australian Parliament. This centerpiece of the White Australia policy aimed to restrict immigration from Asia, where the population was vastly greater and the standard of living vastly lower and was similar to measures taken in other settler societies such as the United States, Canada, and New Zealand. It found strong support in the national parliament, arguments ranging from economic protection to simple racism. The law permitted a dictation test in any European language to be used to in effect exclude non-white immigrants. While the law allowed for the use of any European language, the English version was standardized and became known as the Stewart Test after the federal MP Stuart Parnaby who originally penned the exam. The Labour Party wanted to protect white jobs and pushed for clearer restrictions. A few politicians spoke of the need to avoid hysterical treatment of the question. MP Bruce Smith said he had no desire to see low-class Indians, Chinamen, or Japanese, swarming into this country. But there is obligation, not unnecessarily offend the educated classes of those nations. Donald Cameron, a member from Tasmania, expressed a rare note of dissension in the parliament, saying that no race on earth had been treated in a more shameful manner than have the Chinese. Outside Parliament, Australia's first Catholic Cardinal, Patrick Francis Moran was politically active and denounced anti-Chinese legislation as unchristian. The popular press mocked the Cardinal's position and the small European population of Australia generally supported the legislation and remained fearful of being overwhelmed by an influx of non-British migrants from the vastly different cultures of the highly populated empires to Australia's north. The law passed both Houses of Parliament and remained a central feature of Australia's immigration laws until abandoned in the 1950s. In the 1930s, the Lyons government unsuccessfully attempted to exclude Agon Erwin Kisch, a German Czechoslovakian communist author from entering Australia, by means of a dictation test in Scottish Gaelic. The High Court of Australia ruled that Scottish Gaelic was not a European language within the meaning of the Immigration Act. Concerns emerged that the law could be used for such political purposes. Before 1901, units of soldiers from all six Australian colonies had been active as part of British forces in the Boer War. When the British government asked for more troops from Australia in early 1902, the Australian government obliged with a national contingent. Some 16,500 men had volunteered for service by the war's end in June 1902. But Australians soon felt vulnerable closer to home. The Anglo Japanese Alliance of 1902 allowed the Royal Navy to withdraw its capital ships from the Pacific by 1907. Australians saw themselves in time of war a lonely, sparsely populated outpost. The impressive visit of the U.S. Navy's Great White Fleet in 1908 emphasized to the government the value of an Australian Navy. The Defence Act of 1909 reinforced the importance of Australian defence, and in February 1910, Lord Kitchener provided further advice on a defence scheme based on conscription. By 1913, the battlecruiser Australia led the fledgling Royal Australian Navy. Historian Bill Gamage estimates that on the eve of war, Australia had 200,000 men under arms of some sort. Historian Humphrey McQueen has it that working and living conditions for Australia's working classes in the early 20th century were of frugal comfort. While the establishment of the Court of Conciliation and Arbitration for Industrial Disputes was divisive, it was an acknowledgement of the need to set industrial awards, where all wage earners in one industry enjoyed the same conditions of employment and wages.
The Harvester Judgment of 1907 recognized the concept of a basic wage and in 1908 the federal government also began an old age pension scheme. Together with the White Australia policy and pioneering social policy, these developments have since been dubbed the Australian Settlement. As a result of them, the new Commonwealth gained recognition as a laboratory for social experimentation and positive liberalism. Catastrophic droughts plagued some regions in the late 1890s and early 20th century and together with a growing rabbit plague, created great hardship in the rural area of Australia. Despite this, a number of writers imagined a time when Australia would outstrip Britain in wealth and importance, when its open spaces would support rolling acres of farms and factories to match those of the United States. Some estimated the future population at 100 million, 200 million, or more. Amongst these was E.J. Brady, whose 1918 book Australia Unlimited described Australia's inland as ripe for development and settlement, destined one day to pulsate with life. With the encouragement of Queensland, in 1884, a British protectorate had been proclaimed over the southern coast of New Guinea and its adjacent islands. British New Guinea was annexed outright in 1888. The possession was placed under the authority of the newly federated Commonwealth of Australia in 1902 and with passage of the Papua Act of 1905, British New Guinea became the Australian Territory of Papua, with formal Australian administration beginning in 1906. The World War marked a decisive moment in the history of Australia, remember to this day for the Anzac story of the Army's sacrifices at Gallipoli, and the coming of age of a young nation. The declaration of war by King George V in August 1914 automatically involved all of Britain's colonies and dominions. Prime Minister Andrew Fisher probably expressed the views of most Australians when during the election campaign of late July he said turn your eyes to the European situation, and give the kindest feelings towards the mother country. I sincerely hope that international arbitration will avail before Europe is convulsed in the greatest war of all time. But should the worst happen? Australians will stand beside our own to help and defend her to the last man and the last shilling. More than 416,000 Australian men volunteered to fight during the First World War between 1914 and 1918 from a total national population of 4.9 million. Historian Lloyd Robson estimates this as between one-third and one-half of the eligible male population. The Sydney Morning Herald referred to the outbreak of war as Australia's baptism of fire. 8,141 men were killed in eight months of fighting at Gallipoli, on the Turkish coast. After the Australian Imperial Forces was withdrawn in late 1915, and enlarged to five divisions, most were moved to France to serve under British command. Some forces remained in the Mideast, including members of the Light Horse Regiment. Light Horsemen of the 4th and 12th Regiments captured heavily fortified Beersheba from Turk forces by means of a cavalry charge at full gallop on October 31, 1917. One of the last great cavalry charges in history, the attack opened a way for the Allies to outflank the Gaza Beersheba line and drive the Ottomans back into Palestine. The AFE's first experience of warfare on the Western Front was also the most costly single encounter in Australian military history. In July 1916, at From Els, in a diversionary attack during the Battle of the Somme, the AFE suffered 5,533 killed or wounded in 24 hours. Sixteen months later, the five Australian divisions became the Australian Corps, first under the command of General Birdwood, 
and later the Australian general Sir John Monash. Two bitterly fought and divisive conscription referendums were held in Australia in 1916 and 1917. Both failed, and Australia's army remained a volunteer force. John Monash was appointed Corps Commander of the Australian Forces in May 1918 and led some significant attacks in the final stages of the war. British Field Marshal Montgomery later called him the best general on the Western Front in Europe. Monash made the protection of infantry a priority and sought to fully integrate all the new technologies of warfare in both the planning and execution of battles, thus he wrote that infantry should not be sacrificed needlessly to enemy bayonets and machine guns but rather should advance under the maximum possible protection of the maximum possible array of mechanical resources, in the form of guns, machine guns, tanks, mortars, and aeroplanes. His first operation at the relatively small Battle of Hamel demonstrated the validity of his approach and later actions before the Hindenburg Line in 1918 confirmed it. Monash was knighted in the field of battle by King George V following the August 8 advance during the Battle of Amiens. General Erich Ludendorff, the German commander, later wrote of August 8, 1918 as the Black Day of the German Army. The 8th of August put the decline of fighting power beyond all doubt. Amiens, fought between 8 and August 11, 1918, marked the beginning of the Allied advance that culminated in the November 11 armistice ended the war. Over 60,000 Australians had died during the conflict and 160,000 were wounded, a high proportion of the 330,000 who had fought overseas. While the Gallipoli campaign was a total failure militarily and 8,100 Australians died, its memory was all important. Gallipoli transformed the Australian mind and became an iconic element of the Australian identity and the founding moment of nationhood. Australia's annual holiday to remember its war dead is held on Anzac Day, April 25, each year, the date of the first landings at Gallipoli in 1915. The choice of date is often mystifying to non Australians, it was after all, an Allied invasion that ended in military defeat. Bill Gamage has suggested that the choice of April 25th has always meant much to Australians because at Gallipoli, the great machines of modern war were few enough to allow ordinary citizens to show what they could do. In France, between 1916 and 1918, where almost seven times as many died, the guns showed cruelly, how little individuals mattered. In 1919, Prime Minister Billy Hughes and former Prime Minister Joseph Cook took Australia's seat at the Versailles Peace Conference. Hughes' signing of the Treaty of Versailles was the first time Australia had signed an international treaty. Hughes demanded heavy reparations from Germany and frequently clashed with US President Woodrow Wilson. At one point Hughes declared, I speak for 60,000 dead. He went on to ask of Wilson, how many do you speak for? Hughes demanded that Australia have independent representation within the newly formed League of Nations and was the most prominent opponent of the inclusion of the Japanese racial equality proposal, which as a result of lobbying by him and others was not included in the final treaty deeply offending Japan. Hughes was concerned by the rise of Japan. Within months of the declaration of the European War in 1914, Japan, Australia and New Zealand seized all German possessions in the Southwest Pacific. Though Japan occupied German possessions with the blessings of the British, Hughes was alarmed by this policy. In 1919 at the peace conference the Dominion leaders argued their case to keep their occupied German possessions and these territories were given as Class C mandates to the respective Dominions. <laughs>
Japan obtained control over the South Pacific Mandate, north of the equator. German New Guinea, the Bismarck Archipelago and Nauru were assigned to Australia as League of Nations Mandates, in the category of territories formerly governed and which are inhabited by peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. Thus, the territory of New Guinea came under Australian administration. After the war, Prime Minister Billy Hughes led a new conservative force, the Nationalist Party, formed from the old Liberal Party and breakaway elements of Labour, after the deep and bitter split over conscription. An estimated 12,000 Australians died as a result of the Spanish flu pandemic of 1919 almost certainly brought home by returning soldiers. The success of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia posed a threat in the eyes of many Australians, although to a small group of socialists, it was an inspiration. The Communist Party of Australia was formed in 1920 and, though remaining electorally insignificant, it obtained some influence in the trade union movement and was banned during World War II for its support for the Hitler-Stalin Pact and the Menzies government unsuccessfully tried to ban it again during the Korean War. Despite splits, the party remained active until its dissolution at the end of the Cold War. The country party formed in 1920 to promulgate its version of agrarianism, which it called country-mindedness. The goal was to enhance the status of the graziers and small farmers, and secure subsidies for them. Enduring longer than any other major party save the Labour Party, it has generally operated in coalition with the Liberal Party, becoming a major party of government in Australia particularly in Queensland. Other significant after-effects of the war included ongoing industrial unrest, which included the 1923 Victorian police strike. Industrial disputes characterised the 1920s in Australia. Other major strikes occurred on the waterfront, in the coal mining and timber industries in the late 1920s. The union movement had established the Australian Council of Trade Unions in 1927 in response to the nationalist government's efforts to change working conditions and reduce the power of the unions. The consumerism, entertainment culture and new technologies that characterised the 1920s in the United States were also found in Australia. Prohibition was not implemented in Australia though anti-alcohol forces were successful in having hotels closed after 6 p.m., and closed altogether in a few city suburbs. The fledgling film industry declined through the decade, over 2 million Australians attending cinemas weekly at 1,250 venues. A royal commission in 1927 failed to assist in the industry that had begun so brightly with the release of the world's first feature film, the story of the Kelly Gang, atrophied until its revival in the 1970s. Stanley Bruce became Prime Minister in 1923, when members of the Nationalist Party government voted to remove W.M. Hughes. Speaking in early 1925, Bruce summed up the priorities and optimism of many Australians, saying that men, money and markets accurately defined the essential requirements of Australia and that he was seeking such from Britain. The migration campaign of the 1920s, operated by the Development and Migration Commission, brought almost 300,000 Britons to Australia although schemes to settle migrants and return soldiers on the land were generally not a success. The new irrigation areas in Western Australia and the Dawson Valley of Queensland proved disastrous. In Australia, the costs of major investment had traditionally been met by state and federal governments and heavy borrowing from overseas was made by the governments in the 1920s.
A loan council was set up in 1928 to coordinate loans, three quarters of which came from overseas. Despite imperial preference, a balance of trade was not successfully achieved with Britain. In the five years from 1924 to 1928, Australia bought 43.4% of its imports from Britain and sold 38.7% of its exports. Wheat and wool made up more than two-thirds of all Australian exports, a dangerous reliance on just two export commodities. Australia embraced the new technologies of transport and communication. Coastal sailing ships were finally abandoned in favour of steam, and improvements in rail and motor transport heralded dramatic changes in work and leisure. In 1918 there were 50,000 cars and lorries in the whole of Australia. By 1929 there were 500,000. The stagecoach company Cobb and Co., established in 1853, finally closed in 1924. In 1920, the Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Service was established. The Reverend John Flynn, founded the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the world's first air ambulance in 1928. Daredevil pilot, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith pushed the new flying machines to the limit, completing a round Australia circuit in 1927 and in 1928 traversed the Pacific Ocean, via Hawaii and Fiji from the US to Australia in the aircraft Southern Cross. He went on to global fame and a series of aviation records before vanishing on a night flight to Singapore in 1935. Australia achieved independent sovereign nation status after World War I, under the Statute of Westminster. This formalised the Balfour Declaration of 1926, a report resulting from the 1926 Imperial Conference of British Empire leaders in London, which defined dominions of the British Empire in the following way, they are autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs, though united by a common allegiance to the Crown, and freely associated as members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. However, Australia did not ratify the Statute of Westminster until 1942. According to historian Frank Crowley, this was because Australians had little interest in redefining their relationship with Britain until the crisis of World War II. The Australia Act 1986 removed any remaining links between the British Parliament and the Australian states. From February 1, 1927 until June 12, 1931, the Northern Territory was divided up as North Australia and Central Australia at latitude 20 degrees south. New South Wales has had one further territory surrendered namely Jervis Bay Territory comprising 6,677 hectares, in 1915. The external territories were added, Norfolk Island, Ashmore Island, Cartier Islands, the Australian Antarctic Territory transferred from Britain, Heard Island, Macdonald Islands and Macquarie Island transferred to Australia from Britain. The Federal Capital Territory was formed from New South Wales in 1911 to provide a location for the proposed new Federal Capital of Canberra. The FCT was renamed the Australian Capital Territory in 1938. The Northern Territory was transferred from the control of the South Australian Government to the Commonwealth in 1911. Australia was deeply affected by the Great Depression of the 1930s, particularly due to its heavy dependence on exports, especially primary products such as wool and wheat, 
exposed by continuous borrowing to fund capital works in the 1920s, the Australian and state governments were already far from secure in 1927, when most economic indicators took a turn for the worse. Australia's dependence of exports left her extraordinarily vulnerable to world market fluctuations, according to economic historian Jeff Spencelli. Debt by the state of New South Wales accounted for almost half of Australia's accumulated debt by December 1927. The situation caused alarm amongst a few politicians and economists, notably Edward Sean of the University of Western Australia, but most political, union and business leaders were reluctant to admit to serious problems. In 1926, Australian Finance magazine described loans as occurring with a disconcerting frequency unrivaled in the British Empire, it may be a loan to pay off maturing loans or a loan to pay the interest on existing loans, or a loan to repay temporary loans from the bankers. Thus, well before the Wall Street crash of 1929, the Australian economy was already facing significant difficulties. As the economy slowed in 1927, so did manufacturing and the country slipped into recession as profits slumped and unemployment rose. At elections held in October 1929, the Labour Party was swept into power in a landslide victory, Stanley Bruce, the former Prime Minister, lost his own seat. The new Prime Minister, James Scullin, and his largely inexperienced government were almost immediately faced with a series of crises. Hamstrung by their lack of control of the Senate, a lack of control over the banking system and divisions within their party over how best to deal with the situation, the government was forced to accept solutions that eventually split the party, as it had in 1917. Some gravitated to New South Wales Premier Lang, others to Prime Minister Scullin. Various plans to resolve the crisis were suggested, Sir Otto Niemeyer, a representative of the English banks who visited in mid-1930, proposed a deflationary plan, involving cuts to government spending and wages. Treasurer Ted Theodore proposed a mildly inflationary plan, while the Labour Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, proposed a radical plan which repudiated overseas debt. The Premier's plan finally accepted by federal and state governments in June 1931, followed the deflationary model advocated by Niemeyer and included a reduction of 20 per center in government spending a reduction in bank interest rates and an increase in taxation. In March 1931, Lang announced that interest due in London would not be paid and the federal government stepped in to meet the debt. In May, the Government Savings Bank of New South Wales was forced to close. The Melbourne Premier's Conference agreed to cut wages and pensions as part of a severe deflationary policy but Lang renounced the plan. The grand opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge in 1932 provided little respite to the growing crisis straining the young federation. With multi-million pound debts mounting, public demonstrations and move and counter move by Lang and then Scullin, then Lyons Federal Governments, the Governor of New South Wales, Philip Game, had been examining Lang's instruction not to pay money into the Federal Treasury. Game judged it was illegal. Lang refused to withdraw his order and, on May 13, he was dismissed by Governor Game. At June elections, Lang Labour's seats collapsed. May 1931 had seen the creation of a new conservative political force, the United Australia Party formed by breakaway members of the Labour Party combining with the Nationalist Party. At federal elections in December 1931, the United Australia Party, led by former Labour member Joseph Lyons, easily won office. 
They remained in power until September 1940. The Lyons government has often been credited with steering recovery from the Depression, although just how much of this was owed to their policies remains contentious. Stuart McIntyre also points out that although Australian GDP grew from £386.9 million to £485.9 million between 1931-32 and 1938-39, real domestic product per head of population was still but a few shillings greater in 1938-39 than it had been in 1920-21. Australia recovered relatively quickly from the financial downturn of 1929-1930, with recovery beginning around 1932. The Prime Minister, Joseph Lyons, favoured the tough economic measures of the Premier's plan, pursued an orthodox fiscal policy and refused to accept the proposals of the Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, to default on overseas debt repayments. According to author Anne Henderson of the Sydney Institute, Lyons held a steadfast belief in the need to balance budgets, lower costs to business and restore confidence and the Lyons period gave Australia stability and eventual growth between the drama of the Depression and the outbreak of the Second World War. A lowering of wages was enforced and industry tariff protections maintained, which together with cheaper raw materials during the 1930s saw a shift from agriculture to manufacturing as the chief employer of the Australian economy a shift which was consolidated by increased investment by the Commonwealth Government into defence and armaments manufacture. Lyons saw restoration of Australia's exports as the key to economic recovery. There is debate over the extent reached by unemployment in Australia, often cited as peaking at 29 per centre in 1932. Trade union figures are the most often quoted, but the people who were there, regard the figures as wildly understating the extent of unemployment wrote historian Wendy Lowenstein in her collection of oral histories of the Depression. However, David Potts argues that over the last 30 years, historians of the period have either uncritically accepted that figure including rounding it up to a third, or they have passionately argued that a third is far too low. Potts himself though suggested a peak national figure of 25 per centre unemployed. Measurement is difficult in part because there was great variation, geographically, by age and by gender, in the level of unemployment. Statistics collected by historian Peter Spear Rich show 17.8% of men and 7.9% of women unemployed in 1933 in the comfortable Sydney suburb of Woolera. In the working class suburb of Paddington, 41.3% of men and 20.7% of women were listed as unemployed. Jeffrey Spenseely stated that apart from variation between men and women, unemployment was also much higher in some industries, such as the building and construction industry, and comparatively low in the public administrative and professional sectors. In country areas, worst hit were small farmers in the wheat belts as far afield as northeast Victoria and western Australia who saw more and more of their income absorbed by interest payments. Extraordinary sporting successes did something to alleviate the spirits of Australians during the economic downturn. In a Sheffield Shield cricket match at the Sydney Cricket Ground in 1930, Don Bradman, a young New South Welshman of just 21 years of age wrote his name into the record books by smashing the previous highest batting score in first-class cricket with 452 runs not out in just 415 minutes. The Rising Stars' world-beating cricketing exploits were to provide Australians with much-needed joy through the emerging Great Depression in Australia and post-World War II recovery.
Between 1929 and 1931 the racehorse Far Lap dominated Australia's racing industry, at one stage winning 14 races in a row. Famous victories included the 1930 Melbourne Cup, following an assassination attempt and carrying 9 stone 12 pounds weight. Far Lap sailed for the United States in 1931 going on to win North America's richest race, the Agua Caliente Handicap in 1932. Soon after, on the cusp of U.S. success, Far Lap developed suspicious symptoms and died. Theories swirled that the champion racehorse had been poisoned and a devoted Australian public went into shock. The 1938 British Empire Games were held in Sydney from 5-12 February, timed to coincide with Sydney's sesquicentenary. Until the late 1930s, defence was not a significant issue for Australians. At the 1937 elections, both political parties advocated increased defence spending, in the context of increased Japanese aggression in China and Germany's aggression in Europe. There was a difference in opinion over how the defence spending should be allocated however. The United Australia Party government emphasised cooperation with Britain in a policy of imperial defence. The linchpin of this was the British naval base at Singapore and the Royal Navy Battle Fleet which, it was hoped, would use it in time of need. Defence spending in the interwar years reflected this priority. In the period 1921-1936 totaled £40 million on the Royal Australian Navy, £20 million on the Australian Army and £6 million on the Royal Australian Air Force. In 1939, the Navy which included two heavy cruisers and four light cruisers, was the service best equipped for war. Fearing Japanese intentions in the Pacific, Menzies established independent embassies in Tokyo and Washington to receive independent advice about developments. Gavin Long argues that the Labour opposition urged greater national self-reliance through a build-up of manufacturing and more emphasis on the Army and ROF. As Chief of the General Staff, John Lavarack also advocated. In November 1936, Labour leader John Curtin said the dependence of Australia upon the competence, let alone the readiness, of British statesmen to send forces to our aid is too dangerous a hazard upon which to found Australia's defence policy. According to John Robertson, some British leaders had also realised that their country could not fight Japan and Germany at the same time. But this was never discussed candidly at meeting of Australian and British defence planners, such as the 1937 Imperial Conference. By September 1939 the Australian Army numbered 3,000 regulars. A recruiting campaign in late 1938, led by Major General Thomas Blamey increased the reserve militia to almost 80,000. The 1st Division raised for war was designated the 6th Division, of the 2nd AFE, there being five militia divisions on paper and a 1st AFE in the First World War. On September 3, 1939, the Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, made a national radio broadcast, My Fellow Australians. It is my melancholy duty to inform you, officially, that, in consequence of the persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that, as a result, Australia is also at war. Thus began Australia's involvement in the six-year global conflict. Australians were to fight in an extraordinary variety of locations, from withstanding the advance of Hitler's panzers in the siege of Tobruk, to turning back the advance of the Imperial Japanese Army in the New Guinea campaign. From bomber missions over Europe and Mediterranean naval engagements, 
to facing Japanese mini-sub raids on Sydney Harbour and devastating air raids on the city of Darwin. The recruitment of a volunteer military force for service at home and abroad was announced, the second Australian Imperial Force and a citizen militia organised for local defence. Troubled by Britain's failure to increase defences at Singapore, Menzies was cautious in committing troops to Europe. By the end of June 1940, France, Norway, Denmark and the Low Countries had fallen to Nazi Germany. Britain stood alone with its dominions. Menzies called for all-out war, increasing federal powers and introducing conscription. Menzies' minority government came to rely on just two independents after the 1940 election. In January 1941, Menzies flew to Britain to discuss the weakness of Singapore's defences. Arriving in London during the Blitz, Menzies was invited into Winston Churchill's British War Cabinet for the duration of his visit. Returning to Australia, with the threat of Japan imminent and with the Australian Army suffering badly in the Greek and Crete campaigns, Menzies reapproached the Labour Party to form a war cabinet. Unable to secure their support, and with an unworkable parliamentary majority, Menzies resigned as Prime Minister. The coalition held office for another month, before the independents switched allegiance and John Curtin was sworn in as Prime Minister. Eight weeks later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. From 1940 to 1941, Australian forces played prominent roles in the fighting in the Mediterranean theatre, including Operation Compass, the Siege of Tobruk, the Greek Campaign, the Battle of Crete, the Syria-Lebanon Campaign and the Second Battle of El Alamein. A garrison of around 14,000 Australian soldiers, commanded by Lieutenant General Leslie Mooreshead was besieged in Tobruk, Libya by the German-Italian army of General Erwin Rommel between April and August 1941. The Nazi propagandist Lord Haha derided the defenders as rats, a term the soldiers adopted as an ironic compliment, the rats of Tobruk. Vital in the defence of Egypt and the Suez Canal, the siege saw the advance of the German army halted for the first time and provided a morale boost for the British Commonwealth, which was then standing alone against Hitler. The war came closer to home when HMAS Sydney was lost with all hands in battle with the German raider Cormoran in November 1941. With most of Australia's best forces committed to fight against Hitler in the Middle East, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the U.S. naval base in Hawaii, on December 8, 1941. The British battleship HMS Prince of Wales and battlecruiser HMS Repulse sent to defend Singapore were sunk soon afterwards. Australia was ill-prepared for an attack, lacking armaments, modern fighter aircraft, heavy bombers and aircraft carriers. While demanding reinforcements from Churchill, on December 27, 1941 Curtin published an historic announcement, the Australian government, regards the Pacific struggle as primarily one in which the United States and Australia must have the fullest say in the direction of the democracy's fighting plan. Without inhibitions of any kind, I make it clear that Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. British Malaya quickly collapsed, shocking the Australian nation. British, Indian and Australian troops made a disorganised last stand at Singapore, before surrendering on February 15, 1942. Around 15,000 Australian soldiers became prisoners of war. Curtin predicted that the battle for Australia would now follow. On February 19, Darwin suffered a devastating air raid, 
the first time the Australian mainland had ever been attacked by enemy forces. Over the following 19 months, Australia was attacked from the air almost 100 times. Two battle-hardened Australian divisions were already steaming from the Middle East for Singapore. Churchill wanted them diverted to Burma, but Curtin refused, and anxiously awaited their return to Australia. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered his commander in the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur, to formulate a Pacific defense plan with Australia in March 1942. Curtin agreed to place Australian forces under the command of General MacArthur, who became Supreme Commander of the Southwest Pacific. Curtin had thus presided over a fundamental shift in Australia's foreign policy. MacArthur moved his headquarters to Melbourne in March 1942 and American troops began massing in Australia. In late May 1942, Japanese midget submarines sank an accommodation vessel in a daring raid on Sydney Harbour. On June 8, 1942, two Japanese submarines briefly shelled Sydney's eastern suburbs and the city of Newcastle. In an effort to isolate Australia, the Japanese planned a seaborne invasion of Port Moresby, in the Australian territory of New Guinea. In May 1942, the U.S. Navy engaged the Japanese in the Battle of the Coral Sea and halted the attack. The Battle of Midway in June effectively defeated the Japanese Navy and the Japanese Army launched a land assault on Moresby from the north. Between July and November 1942, Australian forces repulsed Japanese attempts on the city by way of the Kokoda Track, in the highlands of New Guinea. The Battle of Milne Bay in August 1942 was the first Allied defeat of Japanese land forces. Meanwhile, in North Africa, the Axis powers had driven Allies back into Egypt. A turning point came between July and November 1942, when Australia's 9th Division played a crucial role in some of the heaviest fighting of the First and Second Battle of El Alamein which turned the North Africa campaign in favour of the Allies. The Battle of Bunagunna, between November 1942 and January 1943, set the tone for the bitter final stages of the New Guinea campaign, which persisted into 1945. The offensives in Papua and New Guinea of 1943-44 were the single largest series of connected operations ever mounted by the Australian Armed Forces. On May 14, 1943, the Australian hospital ship Centaur, though clearly marked as a medical vessel, was sunk by Japanese raiders off the Queensland coast, killing 268 including all but one of the nursing staff, further enraging popular opinion against Japan. Australian prisoners of war were at this time suffering severe ill-treatment in the Pacific Theatre. In 1943, 2,815 Australian POWs died constructing Japan's Burma Thailand Railway in 1944. The Japanese inflicted the Sandokan Death March on 2,000 Australian and British prisoners of war only six survived. This was the single worst war crime perpetrated against Australians in war. MacArthur largely excluded Australian forces from the main push north into the Philippines and Japan. It was left to Australia to lead amphibious assaults against Japanese bases in Borneo. Curtin suffered from ill health from the strains of office and died weeks before the war ended, replaced by Ben Chifley. Of Australia's wartime population of 7 million, almost 1 million men and women served in a branch of the services during the six years of warfare. By war's end, gross enlistments totaled 727,200 men and women in the Australian Army 
216,900 in the RAF and 48,900 in the RAN. Over 39,700 were killed or died as prisoners of war, about 8,000 of whom died as prisoners of the Japanese. While the Australian civilian population suffered less at the hands of the Axis powers than did other allied nations in Asia and Europe, Australia nevertheless came under direct attack by Japanese naval forces and aerial bombardments, particularly through 1942 and 1943, resulting in hundreds of fatalities and fueling fear of Japanese invasion. Axis naval activity in Australian waters also brought the war close to home for Australians. Austerity measures, rationing and labour controls measures were all implemented to assist the war effort. Australian civilians dug air raid shelters, trained in civil defence and first aid, and Australian ports and cities were equipped with anti-aircraft and sea defences. The Australian economy was markedly affected by World War II. Expenditure on war reached 37 per cent of GDP by 1943-44, compared to 4 per cent expenditure Indiana 1939-1940. Total war expenditure was £2,949 million pounds between 1939 and 1945. Although the peak of army enlistments occurred in June-July 1940, when over 70,000 enlisted, it was the Curtin Labour Government, formed in October 1941, that was largely responsible for a complete revision of the whole Australian economic, domestic and industrial life. Rationing of fuel, clothing and some food was introduced, Christmas holidays curtailed, brownouts introduced and some public transport reduced. From December 1941, the government evacuated all women and children from Darwin and Northern Australia, and over 10,000 refugees arrived from Southeast Asia as Japan advanced. In January 1942, the Manpower Directorate was set up to ensure the organisation of Australians in the best possible way to meet all defence requirements. Minister for War Organisation of Industry, John Dedman introduced a degree of austerity and government control previously unknown, to such an extent that he was nicknamed the man who killed Father Christmas. In May 1942 uniform tax laws were introduced in Australia, as state governments relinquished their control over income taxation, the significance of this decision was greater than any other, made throughout the war, as it added extensive powers to the federal government and greatly reduced the financial autonomy of the states. Manufacturing grew significantly because of the war. In 1939 there were only three Australian firms producing machine tools, but by 1943 there were more than 100 doing so. From having few front-line aircraft in 1939, the ROF had become the fourth largest Allied Air Force by 1945. A number of aircraft were built under licence in Australia before the war's end notably the Beaufort and Bowfighter, although the majority of aircraft were from Britain and later, the US. The Boomerang Fighter, designed and built in four months of 1942, emphasised the desperate state Australia found itself in as the Japanese advanced. Australia also created, virtually from nothing, a significant female workforce engaged in direct war production. Between 1939 and 1944 the number of women working in factories rose from 171,000 to 286,000. Dame Enid Lyons, widow of former Prime Minister Joseph Lyons, became the first woman elected to the House of Representatives in 1943, joining the Robert Menzies new centre-right Liberal Party of Australia formed in 1945.
At the same election, Dorothy Tangney became the first woman elected to the Senate. Politically, Robert Menzies and the Liberal Party of Australia dominated much of the immediate post-war era, defeating the Labour government of Ben Chifley in 1949, in part over a Labour proposal to nationalise banks and following a crippling coal strike led by the Australian Communist Party. Menzies became the country's longest-serving Prime Minister and the Liberal Party, in coalition with the rural-based Country Party, won every federal election until 1972. As in the United States in the early 1950s, allegations of communist influence in society saw tensions emerge in politics. Refugees from Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe immigrated to Australia, while to Australia's north, Mao Zedong's Communist Party of China won the Chinese Civil War in 1949 and in June 1950, Communist North Korea invaded South Korea. The Menzies government responded to a United States-led United Nations Security Council request for military aid for South Korea and diverted forces from occupied Japan to begin Australia's involvement in the Korean War. After fighting to a bitter standstill, the UN and North Korea signed a ceasefire agreement in July 1953. Australian forces had participated in such major battles as Kapyong and Maryang San. 17,000 Australians had served and casualties amounted to more than 1,500, of whom 339 were killed. During the course of the Korean War, the Liberal government attempted to ban the Communist Party of Australia, first by legislation in 1950 and later by referendum, in 1951. While both attempts were unsuccessful, further international events such as the defection of minor Soviet embassy official Vladimir Petrov, added to a sense of impending threat that politically favoured Menzies' Liberal CP government, as the Labour Party split over concerns about the influence of the Communist Party over the trade union movement. The tensions led to another bitter split and the emergence of the breakaway Democratic Labour Party. The DLP remained an influential political force, often holding the balance of power in the Senate until 1974. Its preferences supported the Liberal and Country Party. The Labour Party was led by H.V. Evett after Chifley's death in 1951. Evett had served as President of the United Nations General Assembly during 1948-49 and helped draft the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Evett retired in 1960 amid signs of mental ill health, and Arthur Calwell succeeded him as leader, with the young Gough Whitlam as his deputy. Menzies presided over a period of sustained economic boom and the beginnings of sweeping social change with the arrivals of rock and roll music and television in the 1950s. In 1958, Australian country music singer Slim Dusty, who would become the musical embodiment of rural Australia, had Australia's first international music chart hit with his bush ballad Pub With No Beer, while rock and roller Johnny O'Keefe's Wild One became the first local recording to reach the national charts, peaking at number 20. Before sleeping through the 1960s Australian cinema produced little of its own content in the 1950s, but British and Hollywood studios produced a string of successful epics from Australian literature, featuring homegrown stars Chips Rafferty and Peter Finch. Menzies remained a staunch supporter of links to the monarchy and Commonwealth of Nations and formalised an alliance with the United States but also launched post-war trade with Japan, beginning a growth of Australian exports of coal, iron ore, and mineral resources that would steadily climb until Japan became Australia's largest trading partner. When Menzies retired in 1965, 
he was replaced as Liberal leader and Prime Minister by Harold Holt. Holt drowned while swimming at a surf beach in December 1967 and was replaced by John Gordon and then by William McMahon. Following World War II, the Chifley Labour government instigated a massive program of European immigration. In 1945, Minister for Immigration, Arthur Calwell wrote if the experience of the Pacific War has taught us one thing, it surely is that 7 million Australians cannot hold 3 million square miles of this Earth's surface indefinitely. All political parties shared the view that the country must populate or perish. Calwell stated a preference for 10 British immigrants for each one from other countries, however, the numbers of British migrants fell short of what was expected, despite government assistance. Migration brought large numbers of Southern and Central Europeans to Australia for the first time. A 1958 government leaflet assured readers that unskilled non-British migrants were needed for labour on rugged projects, work which is not generally acceptable to Australians or British workers. The Australian economy stood in sharp contrast to war-ravaged Europe and newly arrived migrants found employment in a booming manufacturing industry and government-assisted programs such as the Snowy Mountains Scheme. This hydroelectricity and irrigation complex in southeast Australia consisted of 16 major dams and seven power stations constructed between 1949 and 1974. It remains the largest engineering project undertaken in Australia necessitating the employment of 100,000 people from over 30 countries, to many it denotes the birth of multicultural Australia. Some 4.2 million immigrants arrived between 1945 and 1985, about 40 per centre of whom came from Britain and Ireland. The 1957 novel There A Weird Mob was a popular account of an Italian migrating to Australia although written by Australian-born author John O'Grady. The Australian population reached 10 million in 1959. In May 1958, the Menzies government passed the Migration Act 1958 which replaced the Immigration Restriction Act's arbitrarily applied dictation test with an entry permit system, that reflected economic and skills criteria. Further changes in the 1960s effectively ended the White Australia policy. It legally ended in 1973. Australia enjoyed significant growth in prosperity in the 1950s and 1960s, with increases in both living standards and in leisure time. The manufacturing industry previously playing a minor part in an economy dominated by primary production, greatly expanded. The first Holden motor car came out of General Motors Holden's Fisherman's Bend factory in November 1948. Car ownership rapidly increased from 130 owners in every 1,000 in 1949 to 271 owners in every 1,000 by 1961. By the early 1960s, four competitors to Holden had set up Australian factories, employing between 80,000 and 100,000 workers, at least four-fifths of them migrants. In the 1960s, about 60 per centre of Australian manufacturing was protected by tariffs. Pressure from business interests and the union movement ensured these remained high. Historian Geoffrey Bolton suggests that this high tariff protection of the 1960s caused some industries to lapse into lethargy, neglecting research and development and the search for new markets. The XRO was expected to fulfill research and development. Prices for wool and wheat remained high, with wool the mainstay of Australia's exports. Sheep numbers grew from 113 million in 1950 to 171 million in 1965.
wool production increased from 518,000 to 819,000 tons in the same period. Wheat, wool, and minerals ensured a healthy balance of trade between 1950 and 1966. The great housing boom of the post-war period saw rapid growth in the suburbs of the major Australian cities. By the 1966 census, only 14 per centre lived Indiana rural Australia, down from 31 per centre in 1933 and only 8 per centre lived on farms. Virtual full employment meant high standards of living and dramatic increases in home ownership, and by the 60s, Australia had the most equitable spread of income in the world. By the beginning of the 60s, an Australia-wide McNair survey estimated that 94% of homes had a fridge, 50% a telephone, 55% a television, 60% a washing machine, and 73% a vacuum cleaner. In addition, most households had now acquired a car. According to one study, in 1946, there was one car for every 14 Australians, by 1960, it was 1 to 3.5. The vast majority of families had access to a car. Car ownership flourished during the post-war period, with 1970-1971 census data estimating that 96.4% of Australian households in the early 70s owned at least one car. However, not all felt the rapid suburban growth was desirable. Distinguished architect and designer Robin Boyd, a critic of Australia's built surroundings, described Australia as the constant sponge lying in the Pacific, following the fashions of overseas and lacking confidence in home-produced, original ideas. In 1956, Dadaist comedian Barry Humphreys performed the character of Edna Everidge as a parody of a house-proud housewife of staid 1950s Melbourne suburbia. It was the first of many of his satirical stage and screen creations based around quirky Australian characters, Sandy Stone, a morose elderly suburbanite, Barry Mackenzie a naive Australian expat in London and Sir Leigh Patterson, a vulgar parody of a Whitlamera politician. Some writers defended suburban life, however. Journalist Craig McGregor saw suburban life as a solution to the needs of migrants. Hugh Stretton argued that plenty of dreary lives are indeed lived in the suburbs, but most of them might well be worse in other surroundings. Historian Peter Cuffley has recalled life for a child in a new outer suburb of Melbourne as having a kind of joyous excitement. Our imaginations saved us from finding life too humdrum, as did the wild freedom of being able to roam far and wide in different kinds of bushland. Children in the suburbs found space in backyards, streets and lanes, playgrounds and reserves. In 1954, the Menzies government formally announced the introduction of the new two-tiered TV system a government-funded service run by the ABC, and two commercial services in Sydney and Melbourne, with the 1956 Summer Olympics in Melbourne being a major driving force behind the introduction of television to Australia. Colour TV began broadcasting in 1975. In the early 1950s, the Menzies government saw Australia as part of a triple alliance in concert with both the US and traditional ally Britain. At first, the Australian leadership opted for a consistently pro-British line in diplomacy, while at the same time looking for opportunities to involve the US in Southeast Asia. Thus, the government committed military forces to the Korean War and the Malayan Emergency and hosted British nuclear tests after 1952. Australia was also the only Commonwealth country to offer support to the British during the Suez Crisis. In 
Menzies oversaw an effusive welcome to Queen Elizabeth II on the first visit to Australia by a reigning monarch, in 1954. He made the following remarks during a light-hearted speech to an American audience in New York, while on his way to attend her coronation in 1953, we in Australia, of course, are British, if I may say so, to the boot heels, but we stand together our people stand together till the crack of doom. However, as British influence declined in Southeast Asia, the US alliance came to have greater significance for Australian leaders and the Australian economy. British investment in Australia remained significant until the late 1970s, but trade with Britain declined through the 1950s and 1960s. In the late 1950s the Australian Army began to re-equip using US military equipment. In 1962, the US established a naval communications station at Northwest Cape, the first of several built over the next decade. Most significantly, in 1962, Australian Army advisors were sent to help train South Vietnamese forces, in a developing conflict in which the British had no part. According to diplomat Alan Renouf, the dominant theme in Australia's foreign policy under Australia's Liberal Country Party governments of the 1950s and 1960s was anti-communism. Another former diplomat, Gregory Clark, suggested that it was specifically a fear of China that drove Australian foreign policy decisions for 20 years. The ANZUS Security Treaty, which had been signed in 1951, had its origins in Australia's and New Zealand's fears of a rearmed Japan. Its obligations on the US, Australia and New Zealand are vague, but its influence on Australian foreign policy thinking, at times has been significant. The CETO Treaty, signed only three years later, clearly demonstrated Australia's position as a US ally in the emerging Cold War. As Britain struggled to enter the common market in the 1960s, Australia saw that its historic ties with the mother country were rapidly fraying. Canberra was alarmed but kept a low profile not wanting to alienate London. Queen Elizabeth II was one of the few remaining links, she tried to reassure all the members that the Commonwealth family was joining forces with the Europeans and that the new links would not replace the old ties based on historical attachments, which were too sacred to break. Historian Ben Pimlet argues that she was mistaken, for joining Europe, constituted the most decisive step yet in the progress of severance of familial ties between Britain and its former empire. It reduced the remaining links to sentimental and cultural ones, and legal niceties. Inside Australia, the implications of British entry into Europe in 1973. By 1965, Australia had increased the size of the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam, and in April the government made a sudden announcement that after close consultation with the United States, a battalion of troops was to be sent to South Vietnam. In Parliament, Menzies emphasized the argument that our alliances made demands on us. The alliance involved was presumably, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and Australia was providing military assistance because South Vietnam, a signatory to CETO, had apparently requested it. Documents released in 1971 indicated that the decision to commit troops was made by Australia and the US, not at the request of South Vietnam. By 1968, there were three Australian Army battalions at any one time at the 1st Australian Task Force base at Nui Dat in addition to the advisors of the OTV placed throughout Vietnam, and personnel reached a peak total of almost 8,000 comprising about one-third of the Army's combat capacity.
Between 1962 and 1972 almost 60,000 personnel served in Vietnam, including ground troops, naval forces and air assets. The opposition Labour Party opposed military commitment to Vietnam and the national service required to support this level of commitment. In July 1966, new Prime Minister Harold Holt expressed his government's support for the US and its role in Vietnam in particular. I don't know where people would choose to look for the security of this country were it not for the friendship and strength of the United States. While on a visit in the same year to the U.S., Holt assured President Lyndon B. Johnson, I hope there is corner of your mind and heart which takes cheer from the fact that you have an admiring friend, a staunch friend, that will be all the way with LBJ. The Liberal CP government was returned with a massive majority in elections held in December 1966 fought over national security issues including Vietnam. Arthur Calwell, who had been leader of the Labour Party since 1960, retired in favour of his deputy Gough Whitlam a few months later. Despite Holt's sentiments and his government's electoral success in 1966, the war became unpopular in Australia, as it did in the United States. The movements to end Australia's involvement gathered strength after the Tet Offensive of early 1968 and compulsory national service became increasingly unpopular. In the 1969 elections, the government hung on despite a significant decline in popularity. Moratorium marches held across Australia in mid-1970 attracted large crowds the Melbourne March of 100,000 being led by Labour MP Jim Cairns. As the Nixon administration proceeded with Vietnamization of the war and began the withdrawal of troops, so did the Australian government. In November 1970 First Australian Task Force was reduced to two battalions and in November 1971, one ATF was withdrawn from Vietnam. The last military advisers of the OTV were withdrawn by the Whitlam Labour Government in mid-December 1972. The Australian military presence in Vietnam had lasted ten years, and in purely human cost over 500 had been killed and more than 2,000 wounded. The war cost Australia $218 million between 1962 and 1972. By the mid-1960s, a new nationalism was emerging. The National Trust of Australia began to be active in preserving Australia's natural, cultural and historic heritage. Australian TV saw locally made dramas and comedies appear, and programs such as Homicide developed strong local loyalty while Skippy the Bush Kangaroo became a global phenomenon. Liberal Prime Minister John Gordon, a battle-scarred former fighter pilot who described himself as Australian to the Boothiels, established the Australian Council for the Arts the Australian Film Development Corporation and the National Film and Television Training School. The iconic Sydney Opera House opened in 1973. In the same year, Patrick White became the first Australian to win a Nobel Prize for Literature. Australian history had begun to appear on school curricula by the 1970s. From the early 1970s, the Australian cinema began to produce the Australian new wave of films based on uniquely Australian themes. The South Australian Film Corporation took the lead in supporting filmmaking, with successes including quintessential Australian films Sunday Too Far Away, Picnic at Hanging Rock, Breaker Morant, and Gallipoli. The national funding body, the Australian Film Commission, was established in 1975. Significant changes also occurred to Australia's censorship laws after the new Liberal Minister for Customs and Excise, Don Chip, 
was appointed in 1969. In 1968, Barry Humphreys and Nicholas Garland's cartoon book featuring the Larrikin character Barry McKenzie was banned. Only a few years later, the book had been made as a film, partly with the support of government funding. Barry McKenzie both celebrated and parroted Australian nationalism. Historian Richard White also argues that while many of the plays, novels, and films produced in the 1970s were intensely critical of aspects of Australian life, they were absorbed by the new nationalism and applauded for their Australianness. In 1973, businessman Ken Meyer commented, We like to think we have a distinct style of our own. We have outgrown a lot of our inadequacies. There was a time when an interest in the arts threw doubts on one's masculinity. In 1973, historian Jeffrey Sorrell, in his 1973 From Deserts the Prophets Come, argued that while Australia had finally arrived at mature nationhood, until that time that the most important study of Australia had been found in creative treatments, rather than academic study at universities and schools. The 1960s was a key decade for Indigenous rights. In 1962, the Menzies government's Commonwealth Electoral Act provided that all Indigenous people should have the right to enroll and vote at federal elections. In 1965, Queensland became the last state to confer state voting rights on Aboriginal people. A 1967 referendum called by the Holt government saw Australians vote by a 90 per centre majority to change the Australian constitution to include all Aborigines in the national census and allow the federal parliament to legislate on their behalf. A Council for Aboriginal Affairs was established. Indigenous Australians began to take up representation in Australian parliaments. In 1971, the Liberal Neville Bonner was appointed to the Senate, becoming the first Aborigine in federal parliament. Bonner remained in the Senate until 1983. Hyacinth Toome Goodalum of the country Liberal Party in the Northern Territory and Eric Deerl of the National Party of Queensland became the first Indigenous people elected to territory and state legislatures in 1974. In 1976, Sir Douglas Nichols was appointed Governor of South Australia, becoming the first Aborigine to hold viceregal office in Australia. No Indigenous person was elected to the House of Representatives, until West Australian Liberal Ken Wyatt, in August 2010. Various groups and individuals were active in the pursuit of indigenous rights from the 1960s. One of the earliest Aboriginal graduates from the University of Sydney, Charles Perkins, helped organise freedom rides into parts of Australia to expose discrimination and inequality. In 1966, the Gurindji people of Wave Hill Station commenced the Gurindji strike in a quest for equal pay and recognition of land rights. One of the first acts of the Whitlam government was to establish a royal commission into land rights in the Northern Territory under Justice Woodward. Legislation based on its findings was passed into law by the Fraser government in 1976 as the Aboriginal Land Rights Act 1976. In 1992, the High Court of Australia handed down its decision in the Mabo case, holding that the legal doctrine of Terran Elias did not apply when Australia was settled, and therefore Indigenous native title survived reception of English law. That same year, Prime Minister Paul Keating said in his Redfern Park speech that European settlers were responsible for the difficulties Australian Aboriginal communities continued to face, we committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. We practiced discrimination and exclusion. In 
it was our ignorance and our prejudice. In 1999 Parliament passed a motion of reconciliation drafted by Prime Minister John Howard and Aboriginal Senator Aidan Ridgway naming mistreatment of Indigenous Australians as the most blemished chapter in our national history. In 2008, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd issued a public apology to members of the Stolen Generations on behalf of the Australian Government. Australia administered Papua New Guinea and Nauru for much of the 20th century. Papua and New Guinea adopted self-government in 1972 and on September 15, 1975, the territory became the independent nation of Papua New Guinea. Australia had captured the island of Nauru from the German Empire in 1914. After Japanese occupation during World War II, it became a UN Trust territory under Australia and remained so until achieving independence in 1968. In 1974, the Commonwealth Court of Conciliation and Arbitration granted women the full adult wage. However, resistance to women being employed in certain industries remained until well into the 1970s. Because of obstruction from elements of the union's movement, it would take until 1975 for women to be admitted as drivers on Melbourne's trams, and Sir Reginald Ansett refused to allow women to train as pilots as late as 1979. Australia had led the world in bringing women's suffrage rights during the late 19th century and Edith Cowan was elected to the West Australian Legislative Assembly in 1921. Damien Lyons, was the first woman to hold a cabinet post in the 1949 Ministry of Robert Menzies and finally, Rosemary Follett was elected Chief Minister of the Australian Capital Territory in 1989, becoming the first woman elected to lead a state or territory. By 2010, the people of Australia's oldest city, Sydney had female leaders occupying every major political office above them, with Clover Moore as Lord Mayor, Christina Keneally as Premier of New South Wales, Marie Bashir as Governor of New South Wales, Julia Gillard as Prime Minister, Quinton Bryce as Governor General of Australia and Elizabeth II as Queen of Australia. Elected in December 1972 after 23 years in opposition, Labour won office under Gough Whitlam, introducing a significant program of social change and reform and dramatically expanding the federal budget. Within a few weeks the last military advisers in Vietnam were recalled, and national service ended. The People's Republic of China was recognized and the embassy in Taiwan closed. Over the next few years, university fees were abolished and a national health care scheme established. Significant changes were made to school funding. The Whitlam government's agenda endeared it to some Australians, but not all. Some of the state governments were openly hostile to it, and as it did not control the Senate, much of its legislation was rejected or amended. The Queensland Country Party government of Job Julka Peterson had particularly bad relations with the federal government. Even after it was re-elected at elections in May 1974, the Senate remained an obstacle to its political agenda. At the only joint sitting of Parliament, in August 1974, six key pieces of legislation were passed. In 1974, Whitlam selected John Kerr, a former member of the Labour Party and presiding Chief Justice of New South Wales to serve as Governor-General. The Whitlam government was re-elected with a decreased majority in the lower house in the 1974 election. In 1974-75 the government thought about borrowing US$4 billion US dollar in foreign loans. Minister Rex Connor conducted secret discussions with a loan broker from Pakistan, and the treasurer, Jim Cairns, 
misled Parliament over the issue. Arguing the government was incompetent following the loans affair, the opposition Liberal Country Party coalition delayed passage of the government's money bills in the Senate, until the government would promise a new election. Whitlam refused, Malcolm Fraser, leader of the opposition insisted. The deadlock ended when the Whitlam government was dismissed by the Governor-General, John Kerr on November 11, 1975 and Fraser was installed as caretaker Prime Minister, pending an election. The reserve powers granted to the Governor-General by the Australian Constitution, had allowed an elected government to be dismissed without warning by a representative of the monarch. At elections held in late 1975, Malcolm Fraser and the coalition were elected in a landslide victory. The Fraser government won two subsequent elections. Fraser maintained some of the social reforms of the Whitlam era, while seeking increased fiscal restraint. His government included the first Aboriginal federal parliamentarian, Neville Bonner, and in 1976, Parliament passed the Aboriginal Land Rights Act 1976, which, while limited to the Northern Territory, affirmed inalienable freehold title to some traditional lands. Fraser established the multicultural broadcaster SBS, welcomed Vietnamese boat people refugees, opposed minority white rule in apartheid South Africa and Rhodesia and opposed Soviet expansionism. A significant program of economic reform however was not pursued and, by 1983, the Australian economy was in recession, amidst the effects of a severe drought. Fraser had promoted states' rights and his government refused to use Commonwealth powers to stop the construction of the Franklin Dam in Tasmania in 1982. A Liberal minister, Don Chip had split off from the party to form a new social Liberal Party, the Australian Democrats in 1977 and the Franklin Dam proposal contributed to the emergence of an influential environmental movement in Australia with branches including the Australian Greens, a political party which later emerged from Tasmania to pursue environmentalism as well as left-wing social and economic policies. Bob Hawke, a less polarizing Labour leader than Whitlam, defeated Fraser at the 1983 election. Hawke retained office until a 1991 Labour Party spill saw him replaced by Paul Keating. The new government stopped the Franklin Dam project via the High Court of Australia. Hawke, together with Treasurer Paul Keating broke with the Keynesian economics that had traditionally been favoured by the Labour Party. Instead they sought a more efficient economy and undertook microeconomic and industrial relations reform designed to increase efficiency and competitiveness. Kelly concludes that, in the 1980s both Labour and non-Labour underwent internal philosophical revolutions to support a new set of ideas faith in markets, deregulation, a reduced role for government, low protection and the creation of a new cooperative enterprise culture. The Australian Bicentenary was celebrated in 1988 along with the opening of a new Parliament House in Canberra. Hawke and Keating stressed the positive role Australia could play as an activist and independent middle power. A supporter of the US alliance, Hawke committed Australian naval forces to the Gulf War, following the 1990 invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. After four successful elections, but amid a deteriorating Australian economy and rising unemployment, the intense rivalry between Hawke and Keating led the Labour Party to replace Hawke as leader and Paul Keating became Prime Minister in 1991. During his time in office, Keating emphasised links to the Asia-Pacific region, CO operating closely with the Indonesian President, Suharto, and campaigned to increase the role of APEC as a major forum for economic cooperation.
Keating was active in Indigenous Affairs and the High Court of Australia's historic Mabo decision in 1992 required a legislative response to recognition of Indigenous title to land, culminating in the Native Title Act 1993 and the Land Fund Act 1994. In 1993, Keating established a Republic Advisory Committee, to examine options for Australia becoming a republic. The monarchy in Australia survived the republic debate which was brought to a head at the close of the 20th century, with the successor Howard government holding a 1998 constitutional convention to discuss the change. A subsequent referendum to establish a republic failed to achieve the required dual majorities with the no case triumphant winning with 54.87% of the popular vote and 6-0 in the state count. Hawke and Keating abandoned traditional labor support for tariffs to protect industry and jobs. They moved to deregulate Australia's financial system and floated the Australian dollar. After the initial failure of the Whitlam model and partial dismantling under Fraser, Hawk re-established a new, universal system of health insurance called Medicare. Unemployment reached 11.4% in 1992 the highest since the Great Depression in Australia. The Liberal National Opposition had proposed an ambitious plan of economic reform to take to the 1993 election, including the introduction of a goods and services tax. Keating shuffled treasurers, campaigned strongly against the tax, and won the 1993 election. With foreign debt, interest rates and unemployment still high, and after a series of ministerial resignations, Keating lost the 1996 election to the Liberals' John Howard. John Howard with a Liberal National Party coalition served as Prime Minister from 1996 until 2007, the second longest prime ministerial term after Menzies. One of the first programs instigated by the Howard government was a nationwide gun control scheme following a mass shooting at Port Arthur. The government also introduced industrial relations reforms in 1996 and later in 2006 controversially introduced the Work Choices legislation, which made it easier for small businesses to terminate employment. After the 1996 election, Howard and Treasurer Peter Costello proposed a goods and services tax which they successfully took to the electorate in 1998. In response to the High Court's decision in Wick Peoples v Queensland, the Howard government introduced legislation which, among other things, introduced a registration test for claimants, gave the government management rights over recognized native title, and imposed stricter time limits on claims. In 1999, Australia led a United Nations force into East Timor to help establish democracy and independence for that nation following political violence. During this period Australia committed to a number of other peacekeeping and stabilisation operations, notably in Bougainville, including Operation Bell ISI, as well as Operation Help Emfren and the Australian-led Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands in the early 2000s, and the 2006 East Timorese Crisis. Australia hosted the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney to great international acclaim. The opening ceremony featured a host of iconic Australian imagery and history and the flame ceremony honoured women athletes, including swimmer Don Fraser, with Aboriginal runner Cathy Freeman lighting the Olympic flame. In 2004, Howard led the response to the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, with Australia raising the most money in the least amount of time to help Australia's neighbour, Indonesia, and other countries in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. In 2005, following the September 11 attacks, 
the 2002 Bali bombings and the Benbrika plot, the government introduced new counter-terrorism laws which, among other things, allowed for preventative detention and control orders, prohibited incitement of terrorist acts, and prohibited reckless provision of funding to terrorists. Australia also committed troops to the Afghanistan War and the Iraq War. In 2007 following the release of the Little Children Are Sacred report detailing widespread abuse in Aboriginal communities, the Howard government launched the Northern Territory Intervention to Combat Drugs and Sexual Abuse. The Howard government expanded immigration overall, but instituted often controversial tough immigration policies and laws to discourage people arriving by boat without authorization. These policies included the Pacific Solution, which involved detaining asylum seekers in detention centers in Nauru and Papua New Guinea while their refugee status was determined, as well as a policy of turning back vessels intercepted at sea. Two significant controversies involving asylum seekers were the Children Overboard Affair and the Tampa Affair. While Australia maintained traditional links to the Commonwealth and strong support for the United States alliance, trade with Asia during this period continued to increase dramatically, particularly with China. Australia enjoyed an extended period of economic growth and prosperity. The Howard government passed several tax cuts and embarked on a program of privatisation. The money gained from the sale of various government assets and corporations, such as Telstra, were put into a sovereign wealth fund and used to reduce the national debt. However, Howard was defeated in 2007 and the Labour Party's Kevin Rudd defeated him and Rudd held the office until June 2010, when he was replaced as the leader of the party. Rudd used his term in office to symbolically ratify the Kyoto Protocol and led an historic parliamentary apology to the stolen generation. The Mandarin Chinese-speaking former diplomat also pursued energetic foreign policy and initially sought to instigate a price on carbon, in the Australian economy to combat global warming but which he later reneged on. His prime ministership coincided with the initial phases of the financial crisis of 2007-2010, to which his government responded quickly through a large package of economic stimulus the management of which later proved to be controversial but effective in somewhat shielding Australia from the Great Recession but this was owed to a number of factors including the mining boom in Asia. The Rudd government also finalised withdrawing troops from Iraq and focused much more on its relationship with Asia, the government also tried to formalise an agreement to be made at the Copenhagen Climate Conference, but failed. The government also embarked on a huge infrastructure project, which was to be fraught with trouble, the National Broadband Network. This project aims to lift average Australian internet speeds to be on PAR with the rest of the world, however the most major policy decision was the cancellation of the Howard government's Pacific Solution, but as Kevin Rudd cancelled the arrangement, the number of boat arrivals swelled and the death toll rose, so in response to this, the Gillard government created multiple different solutions including proposing Malaysian resettlement, but eventually settling on Nauru, Manus Island and East Timor as refugee resettlement options. The Labour Party replaced Rudd with Julia Gillard in 2010 owing to Rudd's unpopularity both among his front bench and the public, so then Julia Gillard became the first woman Prime Minister in Australian history. Following the 2010 election, Labour secured office in the first hung parliament since the 1940 election. The Gillard government struggled on multiple policy fronts, trying to wrestle with a hung parliament. A scandal rocked the parliament, Speaker of the House Peter Slipper, who was a former Liberal Party member turned Labour ally, 
had sent sexually suggestive messages to a colleague. This resulted in his removal. Opposition to Gillard's government following her misogyny speech intensified. Leadership rivalry continued and Kevin Rudd was reinstated as Prime Minister in a Labour leadership spill on June 27, 2013. At the 2013 election, the second Rudd government lost office and the Liberal National Abbott government formed. The Abbott government came to office on a platform of stopping the boats via Operation Sovereign Borders, increasing army presence in the Indian Ocean and resettling refugees in Cambodia or turning them back to Indonesia or even to their home countries. The government also concluded the Australia-Korea Free Trade Agreement and the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement. Abbott responded to multiple foreign policy issues, like the downing of MH17, the hosting of the G20 in Brisbane, the trial of an Australian journalist in Egypt and fighting the execution of Australian nationals convicted of drug smuggling, however leadership tensions emerged again and he was ousted by Malcolm Turnbull, who formed the Turnbull government. According to Stuart McIntyre in his survey of the historiography of Australia, until the late 20th century historians of Australia used an imperial framework, arguing that Australia emerged from a transfer of people, institutions and culture from Britain. These historians painted a Whiggish narrative of successful growth into a modern nation, tracing the arrival of limited self-government, with regional parliaments and responsible ministers, followed by federation in 1901 and eventually full national autonomy. According to McIntyre, that interpretation has been largely abandoned by recent scholars. The first major history of Australia was William Charles Wentworth's statistical, historical and political description of the colony of New South Wales, and its dependent settlements in Van Diemen's land, with a particular enumeration of the advantages which these colonies offer for emigration, and their superiority in many respects over those possessed by the United States of America. Wentworth details the disastrous effects the penal regime. Many other historians followed his path with the six-volume History of Australia by Manning Clark telling the story of epic tragedy in which in which the explorers, governors, improvers and perturbators vainly endeavoured to impose their received schemes of redemption on an alien, intractable setting. With a handful of exceptions, there was little serious history of women in Australia before the 1970s. Women's history as an academic discipline emerged in the mid-1970s, typified by Miriam Dixon's The Real Matilda, Woman and Identity in Australia, 1788 to the present. The first studies were compensatory, filling in the vacuum where women had been left out. In common with developments in the United States and Britain, there was a movement toward gender studies with a field dominated by feminists. Of recent importance are studies of the role of women on the home front, and in military service, during world wars. See Australian Women During World War I and Australian Women in World War II. Other important topics include the histories of families, demography, education, and childhood. Since the 1980s a history war has been fought in Australia by scholars and politicians. They angrily debate the concept of genocide in the treatment of Aboriginal populations. They debate how British or multicultural Australia has been historically, and how it should be today. The rhetoric has escalated into national politics often tied to the question of whether the royalty should be discarded and Australia become a republic. There have been angry statements by those adhering to the older pro-British position. Interest in the study of Australian history has plunged, 
and some schools and universities have sharply cut it back.